Okay, I want the paint family leave. Most of the I want to hear from um, uh, uh, Joyce Manchester, but I, I want to start off, and you don't have to leave your seat, but uh, I want to start off with the commissioner because um, I distinctly remember you saying you had a lot of concerns with all the unknowns, and I asked you to get something in writing to me on Friday, and I haven't received anything yet. Is that true? Um, I apologize. It wasn't submitted to you on Friday. Cameron is here with it in hand. Okay. He has about four pages of notes. <laughs> well, absolutely. He was away at a, at a training last week, so my apologies. Okay. Um, uh, Joyce, why don't you come up and I know you've been, been on the phone with the department and with Washington State and uh, what, what I'm passing out here, don't read too much into this, there, there's some yellow stuff on here on some issues we talked about briefly that I asked Amy to put in here. But there's a lot of variables in this bill that we haven't discussed yet and are not changed in this draft yet. So the fact that there's things like who's covered or um, um, issues of um, length of time and percentage of pay, that they're not changed from the House bill does not mean that we have in any way decided those issues yet. But uh, and don't pay too much attention to this yet, because what we really want to focus on this morning is the administrative costs associated with this bill, because we got some information last week that was very different, apparently, from what the House was told. And uh, I'm concerned that uh, we're, we're not necessarily um, approaching this from uh, the size of this program and the projections of how many people are going to come on, and we may be designing a, a, a system that's far more elaborate than we need, at least in the short term. So tell us what you've learned since the last time we put together. Thank you. For the record, I'm Joyce Manchester from the Joint Fiscal Office, and I have a new fiscal note that I can share in just a moment with the committee, and this is based on the House passed version. So this is the version that was passed in May of 2017. So it doesn't have any of the amendments in it. Uh, mostly what it does is to update the IT costs for developing a system to handle the paid family leave system. So I'll give you just a little bit of background on why those IT costs have changed. So last year, um, Ways and Means, uh, House General, were very focused on the benefits, who was eligible, uh, all, of, all of those details. And we were relying very heavily on the Vermont Commission on Women study. That study was done in the fall of 2016 and relied on the three states that then had an existing paid family leave system. So in those three states, there was also a system for uh, short-term disability insurance, temporary disability insurance. So for the most part, they based their IT system on the existing IT system for temporary disability insurance. And therefore, we had an estimate of $2.5 million. Now, we knew at the time that Vermont didn't have a temporary disability insurance system. So we thought, naively, that um, we do have an unemployment insurance system, and surely we could build on that, on that system. Um, in order to, to add this program. It was at the Department of Labor. It seemed like similar kinds of, of uh, issues in collecting taxes and paying up benefits. OK, so this March, I guess, April, we've talked more extensively with the Department of Labor and have learned that uh, Vermont is part of a three-state consortium that is developing the unemployment insurance IT system. It's called uh, UI Modernization. And because we are part of this three-state consortium that is fully federally funded, uh, we don't have the opportunity to make changes to the IT system that's being developed. And that means no additions, no modifications, no changes. What are those two other states? 
Idaho and North Dakota? North Dakota. And yes. then also you referenced um, that the um, study that the uh, women did referenced. Three programs. states. Yeah, what were those three states? So Rhode Island, California, and New Jersey. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, Right, so we now know we, we should not count on building on top of the UI system. That's not going to work. Uh, we have learned that it might be possible, perhaps possible, but it would take a tremendous amount of time and effort and uh, MOUs with the federal government and so forth in order to maybe allow that to happen. So we're not going there. So instead, we've looked at the state of Washington. That state had a paid family leave uh, law on the books, but they never funded it. So they passed the bill in 2004. They never funded it until 2017. So in the summer of 2017, they started an implementation plan that would allow them to pay benefits starting in 2020. So we found a fiscal note, which is an amazing fiscal note. Uh, pages and pages. Their cost was about 80 million for setting up the system. Seventy-two. Well, so there are different. From seventy-two. There are different estimates. This fiscal note is very yes. voluminous. Yes. So uh, the eighty million we have now learned covers all the costs of operating the system uh, for the first three years, including the startup of the IT system. The IT system alone is fifty-seven million. Right. So that made us very nervous, and we sort of told. Well, we we told. Uh, the legislature that, that this was an issue and, and we knew the, the 70 million or the whatever. We knew it was a big, big number. So we've since had conversations with Washington State paid family leave folks and the IT folks working for the paid family leave program. Um, it turns out that the Washington State IT system is very sophisticated. It is meant to be an all-inclusive system for paid family leave, but it's essentially an integrated eligibility system that brings in lots of information from many different programs. Um, and so it's much more complex than we probably need in Vermont. Uh, the Vermont Commission on Women study uh, updated for, for various tweaks in the Vermont uh, paid family leave program is estimating about 6,100 claims paid out and a deferral rate of about 15%. So that means a total of about 7,000 claims per year that would be received uh, for evaluation. So uh, we then went to the JFO IT consultant, Dan Smith, who's here, and we'll talk about his memo. But he has come up with an estimate of between 10 and 15 million in order to develop the IT system for Vermont that would be more of a basic system. It would not be integrated eligibility. It would um, receive the, the contributions. It would pay out the benefits and would require more hands-on by people. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the fiscal note that I can pass around is based on the House bill as passed in May of last year, but with this update for IT. Um, so why don't I pass that around? Is, and maybe hand one to so it's a $2.5 million that you're using, is that an annual cost of admin? No. No, the $2.5 million was just the cost of developing the IT system. So that theoretically is going from 2 and a half to, to 10 12 and a half. 12 and a half. 12 and a half, right. Okay. So the number that I used for the fisc fiscal note is the midpoint, $12.5 million. Um, I've also learned that uh, benefits for state employees are 50% of pay, not 30% of pay, so that makes a difference when you're hiring a number of people. So I've incorporated that in, in the estimate. And the bottom line is that I'm now showing a, a payroll tax rate of 0.18% of payroll. The, the last year's fiscal note was saying 0.141. Um, now, you should realize that under the 0.18% of payroll tax, the trust fund would be in deficit for the first four years, and that's because we have that big upfront cost of $12.5 million. Um, and in the fifth year, the trust fund goes into the positive territory, and then it accumulates at sort of a 
faster than needed pace. So that's, the, based, that's based upon the rate of 1.81, right? It's based on 0.18%. So yes. So whatever we set that out, that could change Absolutely. how fast you get to Absolutely. According to the bill, the Commissioner of Labor, I believe, makes a recommendation to the legislature about what the payroll tax rate should be. So I just want to be clear about, you know, we'll get into the alternatives here, but if we assume the number of 12.5 is correct, that's rolled into? Yes. But it, it, and it's assumed that that's going to be paid up over several years? And you just decided how many years and then you back into the rate that way? So what I did was assume that two thirds of the 12.5 million would have to be paid in the first year and one third would be paid in the second year. And remember that under the house passed bill, there's a year of development of the system right. and taxes start in the second year okay. and benefits start in October of the third year. Okay. So I've, I've put all of that into the spreadsheet that, that sets out the, the personnel costs, the rent of the space, the furnishings, the IT, all of that is, is rolled into this spreadsheet. And then I show the um, contributions coming in, benefits going out, administrative costs, and the House passed bill requires a reserve of 100% of the following year's benefits. So you have to have that lump amount sitting in an account somewhere. I'm just wondering where on here are the bottom lines? I'm having a hard time finding the, the conclusions. So let's see. On the first page, you have the timing, and then you have uh, 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 where does it say point one eight? Well, for example, point one eight. Here's one eight right it's at a, the third bullet. Here's what it, what it is. Right under the taxes bullet. Got that. Okay. But I'm just wondering when when we're talking about the. Um, Costs. Yes. And so, you so just benefits are 16.3 million. Mm -hmm. That's under the taxes bullet on the first page as well. Yes. And then estimated IT and administrative costs, of course, are changing year by year by year. So I have not put those numbers in. I do say that administrative costs, if you go to the bottom of the first, first page, yep. it says. Feasibility study suggested 7.5% of benefits or about 1.2 million. So I'm coming up with higher administrative costs, um, about 10% of benefits or about 1.6 million. And that's in part because we have fewer claims, but there's some fixed costs that just have to be part of the system to set it up yeah. and to, to run it, right? I'm just wondering if there's a place where everything is totaled up. Um, that's my spreadsheet initial startup. Startup. I'm not seeing the spreadsheet. No, no, I'm not no. showing you my spreadsheet. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's, it's not there. <laughs> it's, it's massive, and it, I can show you what it looks well, like. That's okay. <laughs> um. Yeah, it looks like this. So it's mm -hmm. lots, 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 and lots. So I, I, I still don't know what it, what the cost. The yeah, final cost is for this. I can't. 16.3 million for, okay. for benefits is right on the top of the first page. But then. <laughs> goes on today. We have 12.5 in startup and then annual administrative costs. Of 10% of benefits. I'm happy to walk so through this budget financially. So I, have, I, I don't I, see I can't So it's twenty eight million plus. I see. Okay. So it's yeah. twenty eight million plus. Oh well, no, 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 because in the first two years you've covered the twelve point five million, right? Okay. That's part of the IT development costs. And we've got personnel costs there because of course people in the state have to be working with the contractors who are developing the twelve point five million dollar system. Right. Um, you've got some policy people who are setting rules for the program, da da da. So so in the first two years you've got personnel costs, IT costs, and maybe buildings and whatever. Rent rent rental space. Um, and then in the third year you start with the benefits. A third. Yeah, that's the last. Yeah. Okay. So and Joyce, sorry, we're we're just 
so a little bit a little bit dense this morning. So, um, so the, the, if you could just give us what's the total for the first year, the second, <coughs> and the third. So, do you want total cost? Yes. yes. Total cost for the first year are nine point six million. Okay. Total cost for the second year are 21.9 million in large part because you have to have the reserve a year ahead, right? So the benefits start in year three, but you have to have the reserve in year two. Is, is that on this sheet? That's incorporated in it's the 0.18% the payroll tax rate. I see. So I, I guess that's what I'm looking for, the, the breakdown. Okay. Sure. And, and, I, go, and then the right. third year, because we're getting... Third year, the costs are 18.3 million. And then so, and then they continue 18, 19 million a year to run. Time. But so then help me understand your 9.6 million figure when you've said it's 12.5 million for the startup. Right, so remember, help me understand that. Well, I'm assuming two thirds of the 12.5 million has to be paid in the first year. Got it, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And whether that's realistic, I don't know. We can ask right. the IT folks. But okay. um, it seems like you know you could spread out the cost, perhaps. Thank you. A bit. So, you got that. And your the so the running are, costs you're guesstimating are around 18, twelve million. No, no, no. Eighteen. I mean eighteen. Nineteen. 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, eighteen running up to nineteen. Right. Right. That's what I thought. Yeah. I've got, that's what okay. I actually broke down. Eighteen. <laughs> right. And payroll okay. tax revenue is coming in at something like twenty one, twenty two. It's. So under the House bill, yeah. the 0.18 percent is applied to all wages up to $150,000, and we've looked at the growth rate of wages up to $150,000 in the state, and it looks not very good, as you would expect, given the greater um, income inequality, wage inequality over time. So it's only growing at about 1.2 percent per year. So if you stick with that wage base, only up to $150,000. The wage, the tax base is not growing as fast as you would expect benefits so to grow. If we increase the wage base to two hundred thousand, yeah. it would grow faster. It uh, might grow a little faster. So we believe that the big growth is in the top, right? Like, so if we took it all the way up, in regardless of income, right, would grow faster. But but just raising the, the wage base to two hundred thousand would mean that this tax rate would come down because you're looking at a bigger <coughs> slice of right. wages, right? So that's that's the legislature's decision. Uh, I think it was Ways and Means that chose the hundred and fifty thousand cutoff last year. Which is smack dab sort of you know actually it's Do you have any ballpark figure just using these numbers? Is if we apply it to all wages as yeah. opposed to just up to um, 150000 So I can do that. I haven't done that. I know that wages up to 150000 are 88% of total wages in the state. Okay. Up to two hundred. No, no. 150000 is 88%. I, I may remember that up to two hundred is 92%. So is there, don't quote me on was there some talk? I mean, we're in this... Um, there was some original thought about going through the UI system. Yes. And it ran into some hurdles. And I thought I heard some of the hurdles were in the, because we're in this development period. Is there any potential that from your discussions that you've seen where once that system is fully developed on the UI thing about moving this system over to there? I believe the answer is no, but you should talk to the Department of Labor people. Um, so my understanding is that the system is fully developed using federal funds as part of this um, three-state consortium, and Vermont, as a partner in that consortium, is, is not able to make changes. So but you should ask the DOL people. Okay, so, mm -hmm. all right, well, we will ask. Yes, okay. and so please... So I'm looking at, you know, if we pay the state dollars, and we just did an add-on or something like that. Um, it seems kind of bureaucratic to not take advantage of that and to say, you know, it doesn't sound like a can-do attitude. It sounds like a can't-do attitude. So um, you'll have to talk to them. But I would like to note that there is a footnote on the fiscal note, which is my attempt to say, what if we only use an IT system to collect 
the payroll taxes and then handle the claims by hand manually. Oh, right. So, so you understand that I'm an economist and you're asking me to think about setting up this personnel system that's going to handle um, claims by hand. But anyway, so here's, a, here's my, best, my best guess. So I'm assuming that a fully manual system would require 10 more people. So the current system has seven people who handle claims as they're coming in the door. Oh, the current system? The UI? The, I'm sorry, the system here. That you're talking about. <laughs> yes. But how's past? Sorry, which claims? Is there different UI claims? No, no, no. Seven no, no, no. people. Paid family leave. Is that additional or a total of 10? Uh, additional, 10 okay. additional people. Okay. So 17? 17 claims handlers, okay. yes. So in that case, I'm going back to two and a half million because we had a conversation with the tax department and Dan Smith, our IT consultant, and the thought was that as a rough ballpark estimate, who knows if this is actually going to hold up, but that they could collect the payroll tax for about two and a half million, or set up a, set up a system that could collect the payroll tax for about two and a half million. This is the Department of Taxes? Taxes, yes. So you're saying two and a half million to collect that payroll tax? Yes. And then the rest of the system would be done on <coughs> paper manually. And that would be by 17 people? Right, right. Okay. All of the claims handling. So right. 17 people at what, $75,000? Uh, they're closer to $40,000, actually. Okay. 40000 yeah. times 17 is what? Two. Okay, but there are many other people who make the system go. Right? right. So I, again, yeah. I'm relying on no, that study. study. Right. But there has to be a director, office manager, right. policy development, uh, communication and outreach, um, a physician to set up the program, not once it's set up. That, that um, those people are totally those, unnecessary if you put them in a computer. Oh no. <laughs> They're already necessary. They're necessary. The person, the person. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. yes. Okay. yes. So the only addition I made was 10 more people to handle the paper claims. And, and we're keeping many of the, you know, there has to be a clinical consultant on the medical okay, side, so, all of these things. So forgive me if I'm being simple here, but if we take 10 more people and we multiply that by 40,000, that's 400,000 more annually on top of. Plus uh, their benefits. Plus their benefits, whatever it costs. Plus their space, blah, blah, blah. Right. That is an upside. The downside is we remove twelve and a half million dollars in upfront IT costs, right? Well, you remove ten. Okay. You still have two and a half. Still have two and a half. Right. The two and a half is what the tax department says they need to collect this. To, to set up the system that would collect the benefits and and. Is, it, is the tax department here? Yes. Doug's yeah. right. Uh, can, I, can I ask you a question? <clears throat> yes. Uh, what What do you see? needed to be done. I mean, this is a payroll tax. Why can't we change some sort of percentage or something on our collection system right now? Um, could you defend the two and a half million dollars you need to, to do this? It seems so, like a pretty straightforward collection process. Um, so for the record, Douglas Farnham, Policy Director for the Tax Department. Um, so I was just looking at the implementation estimate from our from our IT and I believe if we were just talking about only bringing the money in the door with a simple form um, that that is 300,000 um, so I, I think maybe some of the wires got crossed two and a half million um, is would be our IT cost for building coming in and, and sending the claims out oh, for wow. the system on both ends. Um, so now, that, so that, that would be writing the checks and paying the benefits as well? That's what I'm looking at from my um, my systems project manager. He well, says, uh, uh, so Craig Polio? Uh, yes. Yeah. Craig. Yeah. Okay. I may have misunderstood. So, um, so yes, you, the answer to your direct question is just collecting that money for uh -huh. most okay. simple not many fields. If it's just pulling in money, we can we can put those simpler taxes in for about a quarter of a million, okay. um, and that doesn't include ongoing. I haven't asked what we need for ongoing, um, but most of our miscellaneous taxes, uh, we only need so, one or two people. So, if it, so it's three hundred thousand for that, and 
I guess somebody does wires got crossed and someone thinks it's two and a half million when you include the payout as well. I'm wondering what's left for the 17 people to be doing. No, right. So, so that's my mistake okay. because I felt I thought I understood that the two and a half million was only collecting, right? So the 10 more people would handle the paper and copies. Yeah. So if they're saying two and a half million, then I can just, I think, I can just replace the 12.5 million with two and a half million, which would be Yeah, I'm amazing. Looking, I just want to, I don't know that that's a formal quote from the vendor, because mm -hmm. uh, a right. significant portion of that cost would be from the vendor. Um, well, I, re I really appreciate this, because I was getting a little concerned, I have to say, in terms of how much it was supposedly costing just to collect the payroll tax when I'm down the hall in finance and hear about all these massive changes in the, the whole income tax funding and education funding. And I've never heard the tax department ask for any administrative dollars associated with those changes. Right, in my testimony later, I can get into it later if you want, or I can mention right now that we do have a lot of things floating around um, okay. which would accumulate so we might have to start asking. <laughs> um, we're avoiding it. We can absorb okay. a certain amount. Okay. Okay. So, so, so just one of the things that I, I guess we're, we're going to hear from the department as to why there are all many other outstanding questions that may be not included in this projection, but I would, would like a revised note if we do it either that way or if we do it just. Well, that's the easiest way, but if we did just the manual, if we did the manual portion of it could, in addition to the $300,000 of collecting taxes, how much would that cost? Because right. now we're getting closer to what the Governor's Commission on Women admin costs look like, rather than, mm -hmm. and that would lower the rate. So, right. um, I appreciate that because I, I, I didn't know when I wrote you and I said, this, is, this sounds crazy to me because we're, we have only 7,000 claims. Maybe we should just do it manually. We had the same problem with the short-term rental bill. People were coming up with these incredible cost estimates, and everybody on the committee volunteered to do the work because <laughs> it seems so simple. It's our perfect us. off-session yeah. work. Um, I'm an earned income off-session. Uh, so you took my, my note to heart and actually tried to look at the manual thing. And that manual thing, I realize manual is not the way to go in the long term. That's why I'm interested in exploring whether in the future there's some way we can uh, bring in a more uh, sophisticated system. But starting out, it seems to me that there's a, where there's a will, there's a way to get uh, the administrative costs down. Yes? So Joyce, um, the people, where do I start? Uh, I guess my first question is, did Dan, I assume all IT people were communicating together, that the, the, the Agency of Digital Services was working with you as well, because they have resources to bring to bear. They've helped us solve some IT issues on our one-stop portal that we're working on, and they're going to be putting resources to bear so we don't have to actually ask for an appropriation on that. So um, I'm just curious, how well coordinated is tax IT with Dan, with a, with John Quinnscraft. Right, so we've not talked to John Quinnscraft, is that correct? No, and Dan Smith with the Joint Fiscal Office. I did not talk to John because I'm pretty well aware of what his resource capabilities are. I've been speaking with them for other projects, so I don't think that's an issue. Um, I have talked to the Tax Department. I've been talking with the Department of Labor. I've uh, been familiar with Washington State and Washington, D.C. estimates. So I feel I'm reasonably comfortable knowing the background. Good. It's just that we're, as you know, trying to move away from a fragmented IT system to a coordinated, integrated. Everybody make sure everybody has clear on the resources we have. And try and keep it. No, and it, so Joyce, because the people are going to cost, you know, just under a million dollars is my rough guesstimate. I mean, because you have a bunch of people who are not going to be paid forty no, thousand. They're going to be more than some that paid more, obviously. Um, so, your guess at two and a half million total, if you include the tax piece and some other stuff and, and space, isn't so far off. Right. So, if I use two and a half rather than twelve and a half, it's, it's definitely going to bring that oh. point one eight down. Yeah. 
Yeah. But if we end. But if we take it to all wage earners, which I actually wouldn't be opposed to, um, because my guess is there'll be less utilization in the higher brackets, and it would make sense for everyone to be paying in. It's, it's a benefit for everybody. Why put the burden also on low, lower wage workers? Well, you 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 keep in mind you are taxing high wage earners up to one hundred and fifty thousand. Not that in that. I just said though, but for everyone, I think it's you know the. But comes, yeah, but there they'll, comes a point where you, even at this low rate, where you're paying so much in taxes and the benefits, not that great. So I mean, I mean a lot of oh, a lot right. of the payroll taxes we have do have caps on them. Social Security, Medicare, Social Security. Right, so, but if we even if we took it up to two hundred thousand, it would improve things. It would lower the rate. So I, I believe that the rate is the least of all problems. No, I would hope Well, the rate is. If we're still considering your eligibility and other things, right. then right. Right. Yeah, right. And I would but argue that for people with kids and co yeah, we're talking about a penny and a half on a, on a minimum wage worker per hour. But we're also talking about who can take advantage of it. So uh, one of the things you'll see in here. Just I don't know if you've seen the, the, some of the talking points in this draft. Is we tried to make the administration of this thing even simpler right. by making eligibility tie into the same as for UI and making benefits a percentage of the UI benefit check. So you know I, I don't know whether we we'll get more information from the tax department <coughs> whether they're two and a half million dollar how sophisticated the vendor looked at it, but we're trying to find ways of making it the information that's already available just be a, a simple math calculation at that point. So um, using existing information. So I mean I, I I was looking at the ad and saying, okay, we need a system to collect the money, we need a system to pay it out, and then we need a system to whereby somebody receives the application and very simply uh, we're told this is the case for on the federal level, and I guess also on the state level, for paid for unpaid leave, is you know you gotta like bring in a, a doctor's note, right. and you you say I need four weeks, and that's pretty much the end of it in terms of. We'll hear from the department. I'm sure they'll have other you know problems, but I, I think for the vast majority of people, you come in with a doctor's note, you come in with a statement that I'm pregnant, that I'm having a baby, and I want four weeks off, and then they look and see that it's a universal program, people that pay in, they're eligible, and you look at calculate their benefits, and then checks get issued. So it's not an overly complicated, even if we find some complications, I think we can find a way to get to yes and figure out, let, not let the complications drive the other 99% of the of this situation here. Um, Thank you, and I assume we'll await a new fiscal note. Uh, right. Could I ask that when we do get one, we have just uh, sure I can put in cost, cost per benefit, year. Trust no, in each of the areas. Your I still can't find the numbers you gave us for, for the first, second, third years. Yeah. Right. That right. that's, that right. would be. I, I right. think that's what I'm looking. And how for. many years do you want to look at? First five. The first five. First five years. Okay. Yeah. So, Joyce, here's a question that I'm, it's hopefully less relevant if we can find if we can get to a lower number. But uh, and I don't know if you're the right person to ask. But how do we get this money? The upfront money is it? The, it does it? Does the appropriations committee have to do a one-time funding in the first year, or do we borrow against future contributions? So, so my understanding is that. In the bill, there needs to be something that says that the trust fund has the capability of spending in the red for, for you know, so many years. And then we just use the state's cash flow? Right. Okay. Right. So that would have to be added to the bill. I would also note that in the bill, as passed by the House, there's a statement saying that um, any appeals have to be handled within five business days. And in our conversations with Washington State folks, they said, that's crazy. It's not there anymore? No, so it's determinations have to be made within five days. Right, not what's, that what's the, the there's, appeals. There's no timeline for the commissioner to 
uh, issue a redetermination. Uh, so it's it's 30 claim. days to file the appeal, but it's five days to process a claim. I see. So, okay, so I get I'm confused. So, so Washington State was saying five days is too fast. Right. Right. So that's but the, on, the, on the front end, it's not too fast, and in fact, it's essential. I mean, in some cases, you need you have a you have a illness you got to go take care of right. to get processed that quickly. Right. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner. Oh, <laughs> thank you, darling. Let's see. I think I'm going to try to on this side. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioner. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Uh, for the record, Lindsay Curley, Commissioner of Labor. Thank you for being here. Thank you. And uh, I have some notes, but we've talked about a lot of it. So, um, you know, I think our big concern was tacking this onto the UI system. And I appreciate your comments about the, the can do versus the can't do attitude. And, you know, when you've worked in it and see all the intricacies of the UI system, um, it's not that we don't want to do it, we just understand that it doesn't make sense, and even Washington confirmed that. Um, I'm hearing different numbers going around. I'm anxious because I'm not sure where we really landed. Okay, okay. And I pre okay go ahead. No, so let me help by okay. asking some questions. So on the can and cannot do attitude, one of the questions I have, I think, eventually down the road, I mean, maybe we found a, uh, a solution where we found the right fit for a computerized system already, but if we did and we needed to ultimately tap into the UI program. Is there something in your contract or something that says you can't like have a, I'm thinking like of a famous pizzeria in New Haven that has an annex off on the side where they get some overflow. Can we just like have a, 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 another piece that can borrow on that that doesn't affect the other states down the road once you're, once you're up. A module. Different module. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't I don't know the answer to that, to be honest with you. And I think that um, when when Cameron if Cameron has the opportunity to speak, I think if you know we last time I was here we talked about sort of eligibility looking a lot like the UI eligibility and whatnot. And um, I I I guess could it's you, could you worth a conversation. You, I just don't. You have an answer right now to that question? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'll turn to, to you. Answer anything's possible, right? <laughs> um, yes, ma'am. <laughs> Cameron Wood, uh, Unemployment Insurance Director for the Vermont Department of Labor. The concern with tacking it onto our unemployment insurance system is really at the federal level. So, U.S. Department of Labor funds the administration of unemployment insurance across the country, including the IT costs. The U.S. Department of Labor, we're in a situation where the majority of states have aging mainframe computer systems. The U.S. Department of Labor is not interested in funding the modernization of each of those states individually. The vast majority of the unemployment insurance program is, is covered by federal law. There's you know, state-specific provisions. So the U.S. Department of Labor is really pushing for states to join together to co-develop UI systems in order to drive down the cost of maintenance. So when you add something as state-specific as paid family leave into that system, uh, the U.S. Department of Labor is, is going to be very reluctant, I think, to, to want to fund that because all of a sudden your administrative costs have gone up based on one state's modification of that system. Yeah, I, I don't know if I'm not being clear enough, but I can't say strongly enough that no one has ever suggested anything funding this other work other than the contributions that the, that the employees are putting in. All yes, from that fund, nothing from federal funds. No, I, I completely understand, and I think, you know, I, I, I don't, I can't sit here and say that it would be an absolute no, but I think the U.S. Department of Labor is going to look at it and say, although that is funded by state-specific dollars and, and, you know, we can make an argument that the maintenance of that piece would be funded by uh, state, state dollars, what U.S. Department of Labor wants is for each state to have one code, one system that sits in one place, and so although it's funded by the state and maybe maintained by the state, you still have driven up the maintenance cost of that system. 
and when you get to that point, it's really difficult to differentiate, well, the cost has gone up because this state's specific piece or this state's piece or this state's piece. So they really want the system to be as common and uniform as possible. Again, I'm not saying that they would would not agree to it. I just, I, I know okay. that they are very reticent. Okay, so what I, what I need back very quickly from you is a, a more detailed answer as to whether you think that can be done and there's a way of segregating it. Yes, sir. But absent that, uh, here's what I'm hearing now. The tax department can, could contract with an independent vendor that can set up a system, whether it's two and a half million dollars, whatever the thing is, to, to almost do everything from soup to nuts other than collecting the paperwork on filing a claim. Um, this version here, as suggestions, had both the, um, the eligibility for this program, which I consider attachment to the workforce, proof of attachment to the workforce. The House did 12 out of 13 uh, months, which in here is essentially the exact same system that exists for UI. You know, if you're eligible for UI and you have that, meet the criteria for a certain amount of earnings over a certain amount of time, that's what we would use. In terms of benefits, what it says here is use the exact same benefit level that you would calculate for your system for a worker for an unemployment check. Generally speaking, unemployment benefits are only 50% of a person's wages, so we would just multiply that if we wanted to go to 80%, we would multiply it by a factor to get there. So that's information that's in your system already. I'm assuming that if we go with the independent vendor, the easiest thing would be for the independent vendor to, to talk to the Department of Labor and say, what are the numbers for this person? As opposed to them having to regenerate those numbers on their own and do that. Is there any impediment to sharing that data with a, with a whether it's a vendor or if it's a tax department by itself with another agency or state government to make it easier for us to bring this together as a system? I think that would make it more feasible. Um, I will be completely honest, I'm um, not very, uh, I'm not an ex expert in you know, IT systems, but you know, I think if you're going to have the eligibility determinations be the same, I think it would make building a system easier because you would be able to leverage what's there in our UI system when well, that's it's developed. Good. But that would not address the employer side. Um, one thing I, I was going to mention the difference. Well, we'll hear about those. Yes, things. sir. So in addition to the long term about being part of your mainframe or whatever, it is, I'm also asking the question right now, let, let me bring it down to the granular. Um, if um, Eric came in and applied for maternity leave benefits, and, and the, the, the vendor there says, I want to know whether Eric has had a long enough work history uh, or not, and I also want to know uh, what I should pay Erin for her weekly check. Is there going to be any problem, and we're going to base it based upon what's already in the system for UI, is there any problem with you giving that information over to the vendor so they can cut the check and, and process the claim? Can you get back to us on that? Uh, I, I don't think there would be a problem. There would be a cost associated to it, and, and, sure. and I. Well, it's, it's, it's far less of a cost than if they had to redevelop it on their own. So, so all the data is already in your system. So I would want to go back and talk to um, our IT staff about this, who are more familiar with the system that we're developing. I think what you're describing would be more feasible, and it wouldn't be having to build an entire. Um, new benefits portion of the system on its own. Okay. Um, I think the questions I would have is: Is it would we run those through the UI system and you know calculate a cost estimate per you know calculation that we do, or would it be um, you know somehow would we be able to just take the code that's there and, and provide it if it's the same type of eligibility <coughs> calculation? Okay. Okay. I wouldn't think it's. Uh, I understand that you don't have the information right now, but I wouldn't think it would be a long-term project to get us the answer to that. 
Sure. No, no, I'm, I'm happy to go back today and try and have some brief discussion. So, may I just ask a question for, but, you know, you're developing this system, Cameron, that's going to take three years, right? The UI project, it's a three-state, three-year project. If at the end of that three years, I guess I, I, guess I interpreted your question as being, at the end of the three years, if we attach this as a state program onto the final work, would that be different? Would you think the feds would view that differently? Because then it would be a state run, state administered program that you were, uh, you know, attaching on, but after all that work and after all that initial focus and goal on solely UI was. So I think it depends on how an ultimate, you know, if, if you know, the, the General Assembly passes a paid family league bill, I think it would depend on how it's structured. So I think it's, again, I think it's be potentially more feasible if you're having the benefit eligibility be the same type of eligibility determination. So we'd still have to the, keep the UI instead of the six months. Because I, I think USDOL is going to be concerned if you go into the UI code and you, you know, within that start coding state-specific modifications for state specific program that I know they're going to be extremely reluctant to want to go down so, that road but if if you have a eligibility determination process that is the same then it's, it's still, more of a question of okay are we simply going to pay to run these through the system and get you know a benefit amount out that you can then ship to someone else and just say pay this I think so, that is much more simplified my concern though would also would be on, on the employer side as well, though, because that um, is, at least as the bill is, it was currently written coming out of the House, much different than how we administer the employer side in UI. Oh, so we I'm, still have some work to make uh, that consistent. I'm a, I'm a little, what, what are the concerns on the employer side? Just what, is the, the, what does the employer have to do on the whole contribution rate? Uh, the, the way we administer uh, unemployment <coughs> insurance, so you're familiar, you know, it's on the taxable wage base, it's based on an experience rating. So it's just the, the calculation of it is different. Um, and we would have to build that capacity into the employer side of our UI system. So I, I'm, again, I know USDOL, will, USDOL would be reluctant to do that, but you know, if, you, if you have a benefits system that is similar, now you're only talking about having to build a new tax system to administer this program, <clears throat> your costs would go down. I'll just try one more time. I don't know if other people uh, maybe I'm missing it. What's the concern from the, the the employer doesn't have to do anything different with the Department of Labor as far as I can see, do they? Well, so we would have to build into our UI system the capacity to take in an entirely different set of finances based on an entirely well, you're, different you're, set you're, of tax structure. You're, you're assuming that this is in the long term where it's all in your shop and you're taking the contributions and you're writing the yes, check and you're collecting right. the yes, contributions. Sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Which the long term is the hope. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think uh, maybe I'm viewing it too simplistically, but I think right now we may have to start out with a vendor through the tax department that gets the information from the Department of Labor that makes the vendors work simple and less. But at some point, it might as well, we might as well get rid of the vendor and have the state do it right in the same place as opposed to shipping out information. And, you know, I'm not sure it's going to be that much different, but um, that's... I'm so do you want to, you said you had a four-page memo or uh, heard? No, no. Well, okay. yes, notes. <laughs> okay. Do you want to talk a little bit more to the commissioner about other administrative, we've painted a fairly simple system here, which I think we should strive for, for efficiency and everything else. Plus, we're only looking initially at six or 7,000 claims. Um, are there like bells and whistles or Cameron, you want to glitches to glitches here that you see in this administration? Um, should I just stay here, sit? Uh, sit next to the commissioner to try to chair. You know, I my my instincts are strong here. I feel like we're I, I, I get it. You really, really want to do this. 
but I feel like we're pulling and jamming and we don't need a Mercedes, like we don't need the best or nothing, but, but right? But like something really reliable and, and efficient would be helpful and my concern that we're trying to piece it between different department, departments and a lot of manual, it, it's just making me anxious and I'm feeling like we have, we already have short-term disability programs and insurance companies runs them. And again, um, this administration, I, I, I know you all know, is not in favor of a mandatory um, paid family leave, uh, could probably get behind a voluntary. And I just, I'm like, why are we not looking at the option of utilizing the short-term disability programs that are in place that would be so much less expensive? Well, first of all, just quickly to answer that, is to make something like this work, you need uh, universal contributions, I think, just like you do for Medicare or health insurance and stuff like that. But second of all, your short-term disability doesn't cover a lot of the leaves that are proposed in this bill. And we have a short-term disability system in place right now that the marketplace is not taking care of a lot of people. Those are my three answers. Okay. And, and I mean, I haven't studied New York, but again, I'd go to New York where they have a paid family leave insurance policy that they're using, and theirs is a mandatory. Um, but I'm just, I, I just hope everybody will look at that because I, I'm just concerned about the expense of, but the, of what it's worth. <laughs> well, I think we're working on trying to keep the administrative costs down here. Okay. So let's hear. Um, Let's hear some of the concerns that the department may have. Yes, sir. And this would assume, I guess, that it was being housed within the department, as opposed to finding a vendor who might be able to do a turnkey operation and would take it out of your shop. Sure. So um, I apologize. I was not able to get this to you last week. I was out of state at a conference okay. uh, in Houston. So um, I kind of drafted these up. I'm more than happy to type them up and provide them to the committee. I administer the Unemployment Insurance Division, and I envision this program very similar to how we administer our division, maybe not in scale, but at least uh, in what, what we need to have in order to effectively administer. You're, you're paying out benefits, you're taking in tax dollars, and, and what happens. So what I did was I kind of went through the unemployment insurance statute and made notes on things that are in that statute that are not in this current bill. And, and I, I won't walk through every single one, but I'll try and hit, hit the highlights. Um, you know, I, I think I did this based on the, the House Pass version, which um, you know, I know you've been speaking this morning about changing the eligibility determination, but there is still the piece um, on the employer side. So. You know, we, as I mentioned earlier, the difference in what you're asking us to collect um, in the UI system versus what was passed in the House. The House version was based on employment in 12 out of 13 months, um, and it wasn't based on a monetary eligibility determination. So, um, one thing that's not in this bill, anything as it relates to confidentiality of the information provided by these individuals and what we're allowed to share and who we're allowed to share it to. There are very specific provisions in the unemployment insurance statute about both confidentiality of claimant information that we receive and employer information and what we're allowed to share that information with and who we're allowed to share that information with. There are going to be situations where an employer willfully, negligently, Aren't, they're not going to provide us with the information we're seeking, either through reports, or they're not going to provide us with the contributions that are owed. Even though it's not a tax on the employer, it's a tax on the employee, you're going to get into situations where they're not providing us with that information. And there's nothing in the bill that directs us, department, as to how you want us to address those situations. It's a tax that's actually paid by the employee, but it's remitted by the employer. Who do we go after in that instance that the tax is not remitted to the department. Um, so I just want to say that I think the drafts that I've seen, or I've been working with Damien, and where that would be a good example of where we might want to say what the the ninety nine percent is, and we cover it, and then we leave to rulemaking dealing with, as opposed to saddling the bill with every possible scenario of non-payment and stuff like that. 
recognize that that's an issue and then leave it to the department or the vendor or the tax department, whoever's going to run it to come up with the procedures or we'll make it to deal with those with the 1%. Yes, sir, and, and I acknowledge that in the bill as, as written coming out of the House, it did give the department rulemaking authority. My concern there is Vermont being a Dillon's rule state, if we don't have express authority from the legislature to administer in, in some of these manners, then I think it just opens us up for challenge that the department has gone too far in, in creating the program without explicit we'll, we'll, authority. We'll protect you. Sure. We've got your back. Um, so just some other things. Uh, again, I mentioned kind of failure to, to provide reports are not in there. Uh, another big thing I noticed is, um, and I believe the, the commissioner touched on this last week in, in her testimony, how do you want the benefits to be paid out? You know, are we paying them out in a lump sum? Are we paying them out in weekly payments? What is the weekly certification that you would like us to ensure someone provides the department to make sure that it's Good. still um, Good yeah. uh, another thing do you have an expectation that someone who is on uh, a paid family leave receiving paid family leave benefits do you have an expectation that they're also able to collect other similar types of benefits at the same time so what I'm thinking is you know can someone be um, I don't think you could be on Vermont unemployment. I mean, you're, you're, you know, there's not a requirement that you're looking for work. You're actually not working. But you know, if you're receiving unemployment benefits in another state that we're not aware of, do you want us to be examining that and yeah. making deductions on the benefit amounts that we pay to the claimants? House bill did have a provision on UI, right? It just prohibits them from collecting it's Vermont it's UI at the same time. Okay. Yeah. Um, and similarly with, uh, you know, the self-employment, other uh, benefits that people receive, I mean, is there an expectation that we deduct their, their benefits for that amount? A lot of this uh, I, I captured from uh, the employer side. Again, just as the bill was written, I was looking at it as you really can't uh, mirror what we do in UI. So we would just, there's a, there's a lot of provisions in our unemployment insurance statute that employers are required to provide us information or uh, collaborate with the department or um, you know, work with the department in making benefit eligibility determinations that aren't in this bill. So one thing I'm really nervous about or would be nervous about, you, you give us a five-day turnaround and that is extremely restrictive for us. So for instance, in unemployment, we receive a claim for benefits, we then have to reach out to the employer for information. Granted, the system will, would be set up differently for eligibility, but we have to give the employer in that instance 10 days to respond. So it, it could be very uh, time restrictive if we're having to go out and get information to determine an eligibility. And I don't think there's enough information in the bill uh, from for you to tell us how you want us to make those determinations. It's really just, did you work 12 out of the past 13 months, and do you, you know, you know do you have a, a qualified illness of a family member? There's nothing in there that tells us about, um, you know, what type of documentation you would want us to seek to make those uh, eligibility determinations. Going back to, I mentioned um, unpaid contributions. Do you want interest attached? to unpaid taxes and, and what would that be and who would the interest be to? Would it be to the employer? Would it be to the employee? Uh, there's a lot of information in the unemployment insurance chapter about what we can do if an employer fails to provide us with taxes. We can file a civil action. We can require them to bond with us. We can uh, have a Was there a, 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 just a very basic question? I don't know if the House considered this or not, but was it envisioned that the the contributions would be coming to the Department of Labor, such as so, so similar to a UI contributions go into their trust fund there, or is it would go into a separate fund or go through the tax department? There's a separate special fund set up that would receive the contributions that are paid to the Department of Labor. So we can't mix outside funds into the UI trust fund. Right. Um, so the, this sets up a separate special fund uh, that is set up for the sole purpose of covering administrative costs and benefit costs and providing a reserve. 
Um, so, and that's set up in the bill. Um, I think that, is there anything else that, about that that you have that's questions just, uh, about? Uh, viewing as sort of like it's a very small payroll tax, you know, that would be, uh, and I don't know when we talked about payroll tax since the past, I didn't know that it, they were necessarily, I, mean, I, don't, I don't know that how you follow the dollar when you make those contributions of your tax, when you get all the withholdings on your weekly paycheck, you know, uh, where does the, does the money go into all these different scattered directions? Uh, I guess with UI, that does. I mean, when you withhold any kind of, or is that a whole different? Well, with UI, I mean, it it's goes totally into the, the, the system. They pay quarterly, right? Yeah. I, I was thinking yeah. like a payroll tax that comes off your, instead of you being in the <coughs> state income bracket of 3.3% of income tax, you have a point more, more added on to every single payment. So it would, be, it would be collected by the tax department, and then they would somehow do the accounting and send it off. I didn't see a separate check going off to this fund, but I don't know if that was talking well, about. The, I mean, the fund just holds the, the dollars that are coming in. It's a state account. Um, so the special funds, I mean, we set these up for all sorts of so programs. So there wouldn't have to be a separate check going out to this no, when the state receives it. So the, the way the special funds work is it's a, it gets a little complicated, but essentially it is a giant bank account with something like 500 different sub-accounts within the account. This special fund would be one of those sub-accounts within, within that larger account. And so it would come into the state, get deposited in that account and credited deposited in the larger group of special funds and credited to that specific special fund. And then as far as the mechanisms of tracking my uh, individual social security number, that, that's really a question that I think the tax department's better qualified to answer than I am. Yes. Okay. So just, just to that point, though, I think um, one thing to be clear, if it's going to be with labor, is what would you like us to do in, in that instance? I'm more than happy to hit a few more highlights if you would like. Go ahead. Okay. Um, there are kind of more narrow, um, limited provisions that I just want to make sure I highlight for you. So, and there's a, a few other big pieces I want to mention. But um, in the UI, if a general contractor in the state hires an out of state subcontractor to come in, the general contractor is liable for the contributions if they're not paid by the subcontractor. I would you know, like to see something similar in, in this bill if it were passed. There's a statute of limitations on adjustments and refunds. So I think you need to understand that there will be adjustments. You know, we get the payment received and the wage information from the employer. Just by nature, there would be adjustments to that. And there's a statute of limitations on the is UI there, side. Is there, um, I mean, in an effort to similar to what is in here in terms of trying to parallel the eligibility and uh, benefit of Are there things that are jumping out of you and you, say, and you may, and they ask you to work with Damien on this, are there things, are the, these kinds of concerns that you have, would it be in the vast majority of these things, if we just pick, we just parallel what you do for UI, and just say whatever the rules are for that, they would apply to these, Contributions. I, I would, yes, sir. I would say there's probably half and half. I think there's a lot of provisions that I think you could, you know, simply uh, copy and paste uh, into this uh, to make sure it's at least addressed. But I think the the big things would be uh, that that I, I don't know that you can simply transfer over. That I think you would would look for more information on how you you would want us to administer would be. Um, the benefits, how is eligibility determined, how are we paying weekly certification, right, 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 right. and then on the employer side, um, you know, if we're not receiving reports, if we're not receiving, uh, who do we go after, interest, um, and again, the remedies that we have to ensure that we are able to collect that. And then the other piece I would mention is the appeal process. 
in UI, there's a very specific appeal process with time frames about you go to a referee, then to the Employment Security Board. We'll take care of that. So, um, and then disregarded earnings, as I mentioned earlier, you know, in Washington, I think there's a provision where two people can't be on paid family leave for the same condition at the same time. There's nothing in this bill related to that. In the, by the, in the same employer. I believe that. I believe it's attached to the same employer. Yes. Um, but for me, also, if you're receiving income, are we deducting? You can't always plan these leave? things or coordinate them with your fellow employee. I agree. Absolutely. I mean, but I think just the committee, you know, what would you want us to do in that instance if we have, you know, two individuals who um, make a claim for benefits for the same condition? Are we paying out benefits to both? And, you know, it's just a, but a question. It's that I have. entirely possible that in, in, or, in, in a business, two people could be pregnant at the same time, or two people could have parents dying. No, ma'am, that's, that's not what I mean. Um, if, if, you know, uh, my child is sick and I'm taking paid family leave to take care of that individual, is my spouse allowed to do the same thing at the same time? Oh, is your skinny within the same house? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Okay. No. I was going to say the other way it would be impossible to coordinate. Right. Oh, well, yeah, we will. The, the, the one other thing I would just mention I would, I would um, prefer to see uh, would be if, um, if a claimant owes the state money, whether it's they have an unemployment insurance overpayment or they have child support obligations, giving us the authority to deduct that amount from their paid family leave before it's paid out to them is something that I would ask for. Um, and, and again, let's kind of go through this just because we spoke about IT earlier. These are layers that you would have to add onto an IT system unless you wanted to do it manually, but these are layers that would, would be features you would be asking for that would drive up that cost. I don't want to go to the 12 or the two, you know, but just mentioning it. Um, but wait a minute. So, when you gave the examples of what would be deducted from the paid family leave benefit, um, was one of those child support? Yes, sir. So you're saying if somebody was behind on their child support, they put in for paid leave, then the state would take their paid leave benefit. So then, in effect, other people are paying their child support. That's what we do with UI. I don't know. So there are specific provisions that say. I understand not yeah. giving them the benefit. It just seems unfair to the, to the system to satisfy their child support benefit with, in effect, premiums paid by their, their neighbors. Well, I think the thought being that, you know, if, if they apply for paid family leave or UI and they're determined eligible, so you're going to give them the money, mm -hmm. uh, it's either you can give it to them and allow them to do with it what they want, or you can take it from them at that point to satisfy obligations that they have. Yeah. Understood. It just fills out. That's all. That's all. Very helpful. Appreciate that. Can you put the stuff in writing? Yes. Sir. Right. Okay. Doug, could you come on up? Thank you. And you know, one of the good things for the committee to know is that if this bill gets out of here, it has to go to finance. Oh yeah. So some of Thank these weedy things we're talking about, payroll collections, you could punt on that and let us deal with that on the finance committee. Oh, we're not going to let go of Damien. <laughs> Poor Is short-term disability not going? Doesn't everybody pay for short-term disability? It's just voluntary. Oh, it's voluntary. Okay. So, Doug, what, you've done some research, it sounds, and you've got some preliminary estimates. Who have you been talking to? So, the, the preliminary estimates come from uh, Discussions like initial discussions with our vendor and our vendor, just for sorry, education. that's you um, one vendor that you use for almost everything, or do you have multiple vendors? Correct. So, uh, well, we have a, a primary vendor. So, five years ago, we started the we got a contract for creating an integrated tax system at the tax department to do 29 of our tax types. So um, the vast majority of our work, over 90% of our work, goes through this system called uh, GenTax. And it's used in 20 other states. It has a very robust architecture that as long as you're not deviating or modifying that architecture significantly, we can do things pretty efficiently. Um, so that's where my 
comment about a, a small, simple miscellaneous tax being about 300,000, that's where that comes in because you're only developing a certain amount within that framework. So let me just ask you, so for my own education, if for the standard person who's having this contribution taken out out of their weekly or bi-weekly paycheck, would there be a line item on the analysis of the holdings, a, a separate one of a 1.41, or could that be combined with whatever the state withholding is or something like right. that? So I think, and I apologize for the confusion my earlier comment created, because I think it, uh, Joyce's fiscal note, with the context of the bill as written, is, is there's nothing wrong with that. Right. Um, so the bill as written would create um, a newer tax type, a bigger tax type at the department, and may cost $2 million. But you asked me if it was a simpler payroll tax or if it was addition to the withholding. Right. So just like with the department, our colleagues at the Department of Labor, if tax were to do this, the most effective way would be to align it with the withholding requirement. Right. And that would allow us to place it on the withholding form and, and tracking that, that amount separately and doing the revenue accounting for that separately to ensure that it gets in the special fund. That's the portion of this that workload aside, we would be, we're comfortable with that type of work. The administration of the benefit portion, that's a much more complicated benefit program than we do at the tax department currently. The closest thing to that is property tax adjustments, and, and that is really all, fine. we have all of the data on hand to do that. There's no kind of going back to employers or right. landlords or that's anything not, like that. That's not a very large program in terms of number of people. Oh, actually we spend, we, uh, we recently have been, we've been compiling our, our administrative costs, our return on investment, right. and uh, we definitely spend over half a million dollars a year administering property tax adjustment claims. Okay. Um, mostly because of the volume. Uh, between those and homestead declarations, we spend a million dollars a year in, in ongoing costs. Okay. So if you were to work with Damien and Joyce soon, is, is this vendor pretty responsive to you? Could we get a, you know, we're talking about two and a half million dollars to do perhaps soup to nuts. Now I'm not talking about the, the uh, maybe I am talking about the filing of the claim with the doctor's notes or something like that, but outside that, I'm just talking about, you know, once you know what the amount of the checks are, issuing the checks, getting the information from DOL to find out whether the person's eligible and how much could, how, I guess I'm asking, how soon can you get back to us with a ballpark figure on that? Um, I can, as soon as I'm done here, I can go back and ask for a formal quote from the vendor and ask them for an exact timeline. I can't compel them, but I do know in other states they've been very interested in, in providing information to the legislature when we're requested. So I think okay. that at this point we haven't asked them for a formal quote. Right. So work with Joyce and, and David to make sure you ask the right questions because there may be vari variations on you know, what we're asking the vendor to do. Uh, still might want to do some other stuff. Right. And for more context, the, the quote to collect the cannabis tax uh, was, I believe, two and a half million, three million, somewhere in that range. Um, and because it created a new structure, because it created new, new issues, um, there's a big difference between piggybacking on an existing tax type. And, right. The 300,000 versus two and a half million. Right. Yeah. right. Um, so, as I said, the department. But, but at the moment, this is piggybacking. This is piggybacking on to withhold. Well, we're assuming that we can do that. Not yeah. as it's written. Oh, well, well, uh, yeah, I know that. Right. I'm just apologies. But your idea. <laughs> I'm actually pretty up to this. But the your, the piggybacking is on to withholding, right? Instead of UI. It's your idea. Well, um, by the way, I've, right? I've gotten the information that I've read since. I think I read your memo on short-term rental, and we went through that whole thing. Yes, we did. The tax department is has stepped up and said they have found a way to do it a lot cheaper. Thank you, tax department. Or mm -hmm. with no cost. That's the best news we've heard this morning. Just for the record, that was the direction I thought we should. 
<laughs> but everybody except me voted for the hundred and thirty dollars. <laughs> so it's good to hear. Yes, I think, and that's a very that's different nice. situation than this one. I know, but we're just celebrating <laughs> that moment for the moment. Yes. Before we get into celebrate your right. Um, yes. Yeah, so thank you for, for recognizing that. Um, I think there are a couple more th other things I'd like to, to mention Please. on this topic. Please. Um, so, so as I mentioned, we have we're a bit concerned at the tax department, not with our technology or the price tag for the developers to to modify our systems, but with our ability just to keep up with the cha the potential changes this year. That's primarily coming from personal income tax, which. Um, although it's not a certainty that we will require system changes, an absolute certainty, I think it's um, there's been a strong will expressed on many sides that something will happen this year and that it would likely require some system changes. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to ensure, with, with over 300,000 people filing personal income taxes, we need to make sure that those changes are done correctly. Mm -hmm. um, and. There's also education finance is still in scope as far as active discussions and potential changes. So if anything happened with property tax adjustment claims, homestead declarations, um, between that and personal income, that's two million of our ongoing costs, our operational staff, and, and it's, it's a big portion of our um, work. So with those things being in play, uh, those are the big ones. And then I had that email pulled up. We also have the bottle bill being proposed, mm -hmm. which um, I believe we, we quoted like a, a, around a 300,000 implementation for that. I don't. And, and, Gen, and, and this is all under with the vendor GenTax? Yes. Wow. Did the, yes. Did, did the version we passed have any money for you in, in that change? No, but it requires it. So it did not have implementation costs outlined. It had the, the ongoing staff of one FTE identified. Um, but it didn't quantify the implementation costs at that time. Uh, we hadn't gotten a, a, a quote at the time that it was passed. Um, there's also changes with jet fuel and the revenue allocation with those related to local option taxes that are, that are being considered. And that's an area where if we get that wrong, we're violating FAA regulations. Okay. So we can, Sorry. We can, we can sort of Stop there because so you got lots of changes I'm, I'm coming a, down the pike. Being on finance, I'm a big believer in seeing the complexity of the changes we're looking at, and I was wondering. I asked you how you how you're doing that without any money, but um, anyhow, so we don't have to go through the whole. Okay. Thing. No, but it helps us appreciate all the changes coming in. Right. Right. Anything else? Um, I guess I would reiterate, I, I did mention the, the 2 million, 2.5 million. That's based on historical numbers, and that, that could go up. Um, and our, for more context, our contract value for all 29 tax types implementation was $29 million. That's balancing tiny miscellaneous tax types with personal income and property tax adjustment. So I think it's highly doubtful that we would hit that $12 million range. Um, just based on how they price things for us in the past, but we do have to get the number from them. So it's interesting that you do the whole kit and caboodle for twenty nine million and Washington State needs how much for just paid family leave? Fifty two. <laughs> okay. So they But they're doing it for several years too. Sure. Yeah, I mean, they, they, it's not just apples to apples there. I, mean, I, I just want to do a quick walk through here. Um, of the bill you have in front of you, uh, maybe five sure. or ten minutes, and we'll take a break. Uh, let's, let's not, let's not <laughs> ask too many questions. I, I want to re-emphasize that this is not meant to be in any way decision making on many of the outstanding issues we have. Yeah. Yeah, let's, let's do that. I mean, I think we've got the gist of the issues here. We may need to have you back. Okay, thank you. Shall we hear that for now? Sure. This is a memo from Dan. And uh, when we get back to this, we may have to step up. All right.
Thank you, committee. Oh, thanks. Oh. We'll let you pass around the memo. Kayla, has this been posted to the Did website? Did you grab one? Yeah. It's the uh, H196 draft 1.4. Can we hold off on that? Oh. The posting until we just go through it? Oh, okay, sure. Oh, sorry, Dan. I thought we were. Okay. 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 So, um, what you see in front of you is uh, a draft uh, that I've been putting together here. Uh, it's got a number of alternatives for different ways to. to oh, wait. We, have, we don't have that. Yeah, you, you do. Should. It was at your desk when you arrived. Oh, yeah. If right. you need a copy, it should be there. It's got yellow on the bottom on the front. Oh, thank you. No I needed this. Um, so, uh, what you're looking at here, it's got a number of different well, options. Oh, missing one. Okay. Sorry. I took it a little one ninety six. One ninety six. It's one ninety six. One point four. Right. It looks like this. Here's an extra one. Could you not have it? There's a lot of papers. I'm excited to take Mary because we've had it. Yes, that's been the norm, in my opinion. Uh, Rose was asking. Okay, oh, you. you got it. You got it. Okay. All righty. Good morning. Good morning. For the record, Good. Damian Leonard, Legislative Council. Long time no see. Long time no see. Wonderful to see you again. <laughs> what you have in front of you is a draft that has a number of different potential pieces of language. Uh, to amend the House version of this bill. So I'll give you the 30,000 foot view of those since I know your schedule's full. Beginning at the bottom of page one, and everything that's changed or uh, that could change from the House version is highlighted in yellow in this draft. Let me just say, I, I, I will make a couple of editorial comments as we go. Mm -hmm. I want to keep this, because all these requests came from me. So, um, but I really want to keep this short because we have two other bills I want to do. And we need a break. We break and this is Mom's birthday flowers. Okay. okay, great. So there were uh, beginning at the bottom of page one and on to page two. So yes. sorry, and can I just make another caveat that there are that there that some some of us are, have been keeping track of some of the changes we were hoping we might make and they're not reflected in here. No, we a lot of the issues have not been discussed. Most of this is to, to do what we talked about in the administrative. So, okay. Right. So but I just I, want to make sure that that. Yes, I, I put this draft together with the chair. Um, so it, it's there. There are other things that have been discussed that are not in here. I'll right. just highlight what's in here. Right. So at the bottom of page one, the top of page two, one of the things that's come up is the whole um, is is well one the issue of aligning job protection with the new law. And then other, the other is the issue of eligibility for employees under the new law, uh, 12 or 13 months being possibly more difficult to track than a monetary amount. So uh, option one here, alternative one, <coughs> would add in language. And this is the old paid family leave law. This language is also reflected in the new benefit. Add in language that an employee is someone who has earned at least $10,710 in employment in Vermont during the last 12 months. Uh, so that gives you a fixed dollar amount, which is what a number of other states, with the, all of the other states with the exception of Washington do for eligibility. So as opposed to a part-time, full-time determination. Right. So right. So 10,710 okay. is half-time over a full year, eight months at 30 hours a week, okay. six months at, at 40 so, hours so a week, this, and it's at minimum wage. So this section was designed to do two things. Yeah. One is to possibly bring it more in line with the UI reporting to make it easier to administer. And also we heard some uh, a complaint that I think n nobody could disagree with, that there were some seasonal workers who were really right. full-time mm -hmm. workers that were being yep. cut out of this program by having to work 12 out of 13 months. Thank you. You took care of concern number one of mine. Okay. That's good. Would there be an inflator on this going forward? Uh, there could be, right? Most other states have it as a fixed amount that they've adjusted periodically. There could be an inflator, I know, for Wouldn't one it? of our UI eligibility pieces, and that's actually in the second piece here. Yeah. 
for one of those, the you know the number in statute is a thousand dollars, but it's been inflated over time to, I think it's two thousand six hundred dollars now. Well, um, that's my question because if you don't have an inflator, and not that I would maybe not want to do this, but with our eyes open, you increase the eligibility if you don't inflate. Going right. Forward. An another way to word this is equal to one thousand twenty hours at the Vermont minimum wage as set pursuant to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, we could easily put okay. an inflator on the first one and the second one. Second alternative, does have an employee Yeah, so the second one is simply that an employee is someone who is eligible to receive unemployment compensation. Yeah. And that's everybody. No. No, no. It's only people who So are. you have to have earned, uh, and Dirk and Cameron can correct me if I'm wrong, but you have to have earned a certain amount in one calendar quarter, and then in another calendar quarter. To, you look at four out of the last five calendar quarters, you have to have earned a certain minimum amount in one calendar quarter and at least 40% of your highest calendar quarter in the remaining three calendar quarters in your measuring period. And there are four different possible measuring periods under there depending on your eligibility. Yeah. Did I but get that, that guys? Yeah. That that's captures simple. seasonal people. Yeah. Yes. In large measure, which is the yes, key crap. It, it does. The number is low enough that it captures seasonal people. We have a very complicated system to determine this whole thing is essentially attachment to the workforce. Right. We don't give benefits out unless there's some strong, strong, strong attachment to the workforce. And we had established a system in UI, so one of the suggestions is let's just use that one. Mm -hmm. So the if you flip all the way to page 7, the same language is repeated for the definition of qualified employee for the purpose of benefits. We don't need to go through it a second time. If we flip now to page eight, um, this reflects uh, on line 11 the latest, um, the latest estimate of the, the, the payroll tax or contribution that Joyce has provided. That obviously can change. The currently uh, the the bill provides that the employer shall deduct and withhold the full amount from the employee's wages unless the employer elects to pay a portion. Mm -hmm. The alternative here would revert back to what was proposed in the House originally, which is 50-50 split between employer and employee. Um, going on to page nine. Uh, the change there is not substantive. It's just a cross-reference to clarify what your uh, what contributions you're referring to. Before you go on, Damien, just to clarify mm -hmm. on page eight, um, yep. what was the is that identical now on nine eleven? That's identical to the percentage as passed by house. The no, the percentage passed passed by house was 0.141. That's right. Joyce has raised it to 0.18 to account for. Uh, higher startup con costs. But that could change. It could. Be exactly. That, that All the could decisions change we made. based on a, any number of things in this bill. Right. Including yeah. the discussion we had here. That's right. what I'm saying. The discussion right. you discussion have here, have, the, the benefits that are yeah. covered, the amount that you pay for the benefits, a, a number of things can affect that number. So that is okay. totally in flux. Yep. Okay. Yep. Thank you. So, Serves um, life. The Next piece here on the top of page 10 is an alternative to reflect if taxes were shifted over, if the collection of the payroll tax or contribution was shifted over to the Department of Taxes. And it would require withholding uh, and administration and enforcement of the withholding in the same manner as for the withholding of income taxes from payroll right now. Um, and then, let's see, on 573, Three here at the bottom of that page. The alternative here, um, so right now it says 80% of average weekly wage up to two times 40 hours at the Vermont livable wage. The alternative language here is one and a quarter times the amount of unemployment benefits an individual would be eligible for up to uh, two times 40 hours at the Vermont livable wage. So again, same half on the, the amount that you can get per week, um, but it's it's uh, limited by one and a quarter times the amount of unemployment benefits. So, so this, as with 
all any substantive provision here has not been discussed or decided. And one of the things that's problematic, I like the idea of tying it to unemployment benefits where you can nail down what the average percentage of people's wages unemployment provides as a percentage. And then we have to decide what we really want. The House has 80% of the average weekly wage, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the House is 80% of the average weekly wage. Uh, unemployment is 57 or 58% of average weekly wage up to a capped amount, right. um, which I think is set to change next year. Is that correct, Cameron? Yeah, to go higher? I think it's going to uh, be. Or to re rebase next year? The max is going to readjust in July. Okay, to July higher this year. So, um, and I can't remember what that amount is currently. I think it's, it's, it's going to be higher than the cap we have here. That's what so but basically, we, we need to decide what the wage replacement percentage we want to be, and then we have to come up with the multiplier of 57%. Mm -hmm. So I don't think this quite gets you to 80%, but I don't want people freaking out on anything in this, this bill, because this is... No, I, I did a little bit of quick math last night, and this is more like 72%. Okay. Um, and if you've seen my math grades, you probably want to have Joyce check that. So, um, all right, on page 12, uh, reinstatement, seniority, and benefits protected. This is an alternative uh, potentially to that changes to the job protection language early on. This would put in a reinstatement provision that's similar to what we have for workers' comp right now. Uh, and workers' comp, it applies to employers of 10 or more. In this case, it would apply to all employers. And it basically said, says that the employer shall reinstate the employee at the conclusion of his or her leave, um, provided the leave does not require the employee to be out of work for a continuous period in excess of six weeks. The employee shall be reinstated to the first available position, uh, first available suitable position given the position he or she held at the time their leave began. And then they regain seniority and unused accrued leave on reinstatement. Um, and then nothing in this section would diminish the employee's rights to job protection under the existing Parental and Family Leave Act. So if you work for an employer that's covered by that, you have the full job protection. This just provides you with reinstatement so rights if you work for a smaller a, employer. A, a legislator's perspective, at least as opposed to a drafter's perspective. <laughs> uh, so, you know, the House at one point had this back up. I think to have an effective family leave program, you need some money going to the people and you need some job protection. Mm -hmm. And the House, as it came out of the first substance committee, had no small business exemption. They had everybody have the job protection. So if you took six or 12 weeks, you had your right to come back. I actually introduced a bill in the Senate, which was not as protective of the employees as the House does. I had a, I had a small business exemption for businesses of four or less, you didn't have to guarantee the job, okay? The house, the bill that came out of the house had no added job protections in it. It's, you know, the only people who have job protection status right now are people who work for larger firms of 10 or 15 or more. Right. So they put in a, a, an amount of money to help people take the leave, but people can still lose their jobs and then probably a lot of it will still go back to work because of that. So uh, this is very much a middle ground. It probably doesn't go even to the middle, but it just does says what we do in workers' comp, which is to say that the employer of a small business can still let the person go if they need to, but at least the person, if a job does become available in the future and the person's qualified for it, they would have priority to that job. So, so that's what we do in workers' comp for for, for larger for larger businesses, and maybe the two of you can fill me in because I'm I'm not up to speed on workers' comp. But when you say the first available suitable position, if we had a smaller business and you know they've got a uh, one meat cutter, right, and they hire a new meat cutter, and that person stays there for ten years. Um, You're out of luck. So, there, so first available suitable position 
one question is, does it have to be the same, or could it be, could, could the meat cutter say, uh, I'm okay with taking a job that's stocking shelves? Um, is that, it, do they have a legal right to that? And then the next question would be, does suitable mean that they have to make as much as when they left? I think it's mostly to the pay, isn't it? it it's, it's, a com it's a combination. It doesn't cover with precision every example, but this has been in the law for 15 years in the workers' comp context. So I assume there's either been cases or they worked it out in a way that it's functioning. Okay. So and I, remember, I, I remember being involved in this when, it, when this first happened, and you know, from a labor perspective, it's like we were hearing about people who were injured on the job, and in some cases, it was the fault of the employer, and they got wage replacement, but they didn't have any job guarantee. Right. So some employers, I'm not saying all, would say, look at their situation and say, God, this guy's going to be out for six months, I gotta replace this guy permanently. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, at least you can do is if it's not that much of a hardship as a business and you have an opening for this person and he's qualified, give him the priority. Mm -hmm. So that's what this does. It's an attempt to... And it's the same language. Yes. First of all. I mean, it's not exactly yeah. the same, well, but it's Dirk is right behind Dirk. Yeah, I tweaked it. And, um, so the, I don't know uh, too much about how the workers' comp provision has been construed. You may want to hear from Steve Monaghan from the department on that. Um, so, uh, but that's the, um, what I did is I based this on the workers' comp provision with tweaks, obviously, to get away from the workers' disability to more the period of relief. And the workers' comp provision provides for two years out of work. This only provides for six weeks. Once you go past the paid leave portion, then it, it doesn't cover you. But if your leave is six weeks or less, you've got that reinstatement right here. The second page here on page 13, um, and actually starting from page, line 19 on page 12, and then going over on the page 13, provides caveats for when the employer doesn't have to provide reinstatement, such as the employee already gave notice, uh, their position would have been terminated on its own terms. In other words, they're seasonal, and they went out for leave over the last this four is weeks. Language from yeah, the and that's all from workers' comp, so basically this protecting is a, this the employer. Is a, this is a s small step. I'd rather cover all businesses or cover all businesses down to four, but I think that is uh, is going to be a challenge at this late date. Oh, we, we're not deciding that. We're not deciding that. But it's just a flag issue. So for example, in this area, I'd also love to have us think about uh, an extension uh, with unpaid leave and what might be considered in that for an, another up to another six weeks, just because ideally this is a bill that we that was originally introduced as 12 weeks. Is it worth considering an extension with a, a, when it's unpaid leave? And if there was anything else that we might So unpaid extend. leave already has job protection oh, if it you does. qualify for the unpaid oh, that's leave. There's, there's a federal and a state program. Right. The state, the federal program applies to employers of 50 or more. The state, as written in this bill, would apply to all employers with 10 or more roughly full-time employees who work an average of 30 hours a week over the course of the Is year. Is that worth explicitly uh, identifying and citing other places where it's covered? I, that's cited in here as one okay, of the things great. that this doesn't replace those rights. Okay. Um, Is that what it's here on line Yeah, 18? if you're an employee that works for a smaller employer, under 10 employees, you don't have the right to jump protected. Okay, so um, let's leave right right now. zip through the rest of it so people can take a break. So Look section right. 576 uh, and section 577 address some of the concerns that Cameron raised this morning. They provide for a uh, the collection of assessments of unpaid contributions from employers, largely based on the unemployment system. And then the appeals there, uh, one of the things that I identified in comparing our law to Washington's is that somehow in drafting last year in the House, we left out what happens if the employer says, I have evidence that the employee is faking this. 
um, and they're cashing in on the leave or something like that, or the employer is aggrieved by the assessment, um, by the determination that someone's their employee. So this allows for both employer and employee dis, uh, appeals from both the assessments and the commissioner's decisions. Um, the section four beginning on page 15 and going over onto page 16 uh, provides some guidance um, which can be fleshed out based on uh, Cameron's testimony this morning as to uh, where and how the Commissioner of Labor should adopt rules to implement the program. Um, understanding that uh, they having uh, specific uh, direction um, provides them with cover against you know, being accused of uh, adopting a rule without um, statutory authorization or something like that. So uh, that could be done. And then the other highlighted sections are just changes in dates, and that's it. Thank you. Let's uh, get back in. Uh, uh, let's we'll make it 11. 11 o'clock. Thanks for your time. Oh, thank you. Take up the housing bill, uh, rental housing. Housing. Substandard rental housing. Uh, it's been a while since we've. Is there anything we're not doing this session? That's right. the, the goal is to do anything. Except. Except I haven't heard anybody bother me about the fireworks bill, so if we don't get to that, fireworks. unless you want to get to it, then pro Yeah, I'm, I'm ready. Okay. No fireworks the better. Okay. Yes. I, I, I think we can do it and follow up to your question. I think, I hope you can make it early, but I think we're going to start all of next week at 8.30. I know you have a conflict on Tuesday. If you get here at nine, that's fine. Nine. I'll make sure the big issues get delayed. There's a lot Actually, of small I don't. Bills. We should be done with the governor's meeting by eight thirty. Okay, so, so just... on Tuesday you can't come at eight thirty though. You said you're staying over it. No. Nope. You said I thought you said next Tuesday nope. you were okay. All right, we're still going to start at eight thirty. Uh, all of next week. Uh, I was just thinking that she was David, can you spend like five minutes going through the three? No, 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 especially changes since the last. Sure. So we're working off of uh, draft 3.1, a.m. Correct. <clears throat> okay, well, if you have a record for it, I am David Hall, Legislative Counsel for your committee. This is uh, H907. You should have a draft 3.1 of uh, an act relating to improving rental housing safety. I believe this is or is being posted, and the committee should have copies. So um, it's a strike all amendment. 10 pages. Uh, changes relative to what you last saw in public are all in yellow. Um, the first section is unchanged since then, but it creates this rental housing advisory board. I will say it is changed to the extent that it no longer says residential rental, but it says, but otherwise it's the same. Uh, charges GHCD to create this 11 person board, the duty of which is to uh, give uh, advice on housing to the executive and legislative branch and others. I guess the other change in there is that uh, I'm no longer staffing it, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on page three, section two, tax, tasks of the Rental Housing Advisory Board. So you'll see some changes in here. Um, to be consistent with the new subsection C on the next page where it said potential legislation or policy changes, I've just used those words throughout so the board, uh, by January of next year, would submit to the General Assembly potential legislation or policy changes to better support decent, safe, sanitary rental housing that address recommendations for one state agency, whether to retain or modify the current system of rental housing code enforcement, including statutory provisions in the subject. Under B, in formulating the potential legislation or policy changes identified pursuant to A, the board shall consider the following proposals. The list is the same since you last saw it. I think we can skip over those unless you guess. On page three? Yes. Um, line seven. Uh -huh. I think 
that sense is correct. confusing because it's it's it says, potential legislation or policy changes to support to better support decent safe and sanitary rental housing that but that seems to be modifying housing instead of prior clause so I would say um, a period after housing and, and then start a new sentence that says um, these potential policy changes may address the following issues or should address. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. In other words, it seems as though the sentence is saying sanitary rental housing that address um, when what you're you really have a, a, when you say after policy changes, you've basically got a subordinate clause that's unmarked there that's confusing things. So you say, and after housing, at which address the following issues? Yeah. Okay, that's another one. Okay. We'll do that. Then which address the following yeah. issues? Okay, so the list is the same. So we're on to page four at the bottom. Okay. Um, um, so this is the these are the check-ins. Not later than September first and November fifteenth, the board shall report on its progress in formulating potential legislation policy changes to this committee and House General. Page five, section three is the same. Section four at the bottom is the same. Um, there's a proposal on page six here. Um, so what we're talking about is, uh, so when the health officer conducts an investigation of the rental housing, the officer under A shall issue a written <coughs> inspection report and that shall one, contain findings of fact, two, specify requirements, and then three here in highlights, provide a notice in plain language that the tenant must allow the landlord and agents of the landlord access to the rental unit to make repairs as ordered by the health officer, consistent with 9 BSA 46, <coughs> including that the landlord may enter blah, blah, blah. So the, you know, the change in the construct here is to reference the access provisions that are already in statute in 9 VSA 4660 and then to add you know to have this including construct so as an example of the type of notice um, consistent with that section including that the landlord may enter the unit either with the tenant's consent which shall not be withheld between 9 and 9 not less than 40 hours notice and that the health officer is nearby to continue the owner of access immediately you follow that I do. I, there's a similar issue here with the word in that, and maybe it's just the way you put sentences together, but the including seems to be a, what, what you are led to expect is that it will be one of the repairs as ordered by the house officer, but you're actually talking about access previously in the sentence. Do you see what I mean? So. So the including refers back to must allow access. But the way the sentence is written, it sounds like including is going to be one of the repairs I've ordered by. And you can get, once you read it a couple times, you can get what it says. But I, um, I really, honestly, had five minutes to read this I understand. before I came here. So if you want me to noodle on I'm happy to. But this yes. is where we are at this moment. I, I, I think it should, you know, should be. We just, I mean, I'm happy to stop after 4660, frankly. I think that's what I'm saying. Better, and then, um, and then get rid of including and say the landlord may enter the unit. What if we? But we need that. What if we just took the consistent with 9 VSA and put that at the end? So including yada 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 and consistent with. Does that solve the problem? Well, consistent, consistent with 9 VSA 4660. Uh, means that, that that's modifying like, the scope of the access. That's, that's well, wait, wait, so, so the health department wanted the cross reference to 4660 in there. Does, if you have that in there, does the rest of the sentence, 
Is it necessary or is all that information in 4660 already? What about what about this? If you, to answer your question, yeah. I think you, the rest is just trying to uh, provide an example of what that uh, plain language notice would be and what the basis of access would be. That said, it, and I'm, again, I'm, I'm just re reacting to this as you are, um, I think the health department wanted the cross-reference because they were concerned about the scope of the access and the underlying law changing in the future and didn't want to have um, a conflict between these two. And I, I don't think you obviate that issue by having the example language here. I think you still have the same my, issue. My issue is solved if after 4660 you have a period and get rid of including and just say the landlord may enter the unit. Yes. Mine is a grammatical issue about the way those two clauses are. I connected. understand, but that changes yeah. the that changes the substantive effect of the law. I mean, we're talking about what's in the content of the notice, not a, a substantive right to enter the unit. That substantive right, right is already provided in 4660. Okay. Got it. So this is what's in the notice. Yeah, it, it, instead of saying including that, you could, it, it really, and the, 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 the function here is to say, by way of example, the notice must include should could provide or may provide right. the following that's that's really the thrust of the clause but again I, yeah. I, I I I I think that the I think you could end the sentence at 4660 and it would have the same effect you would lose the benefit of example language but honestly the scope of the access is the substantive right provided in another section of law which we're cross-referencing so um, the new language here, as I understand it, is essentially adding a statutory reference. So I would be in favor of moving that, uh, just taking that out and putting a new sentence at the end, that the notice shall be, we say, and consistent with 9 BSA, for, or say, the notice shall be consistent with 9 BSA 466, and leaving in the example, which I think is important to yeah, um, yeah that, I'm, I'm not talking about either the example or the reference. I'm talking about the grammar of the sentence. So does it does it if you put at the end and consistent with that as a having it in the middle? Does that help? Well, or, so, or put a new sentence at the end. If you so, look at the way the sentence runs, the landlord and agents of the landlord access to the rental unit, and then including modifies that part. But the way it's written now, it sounds like it's it sounds like it's modifying repairs, including. So when you're reading it, you're you're expecting that it's going to delineate a repair, but it's not. It's going back to the. So all you have to do is just re. All the all the pieces are fine. It's just that the grammatical order leads you into a mistaken interpretation of what you're reading until you get to the bottom of the sentence. So. So, let's, so what's so your fix? Let's, let's, I, my fix is to have David move If you on. want to have everything in here that's yeah. here, but you just want it moved around for yes. clarity, yes. let me take yeah. that back okay. to my office and I can do that. Thank you. I see where you get your nickname from. What is the name? Grammarian. Grammarian. Grammar man. Oh, grammar man. 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 Well, Which is fine to write about that. No, no. It's solid. I was, of course, solving it in a way that made it not the intent. Right. Okay, it was easy enough to do. Let's go on. All right. Um, okay. The certificate oh. piece through page eight is all the, the same. same. And then um, section seven. And I, you know, I assume you've heard all the pros and cons of section six and access to. Well, I was going to just ask. We do have the, the farm here. Sure. Is there any? Uh, I know you're not thrilled with this section, but is there any simple change or addition you're we'll be looking for? Um, Landlord certificate. So the, the department's opposition to this is primarily on the basis of confidentiality. Um, so if, if the legislature decides to propose to publish that information, then, you know, uh, so it's, 
but structurally, we will need time to be ready to publish this. So the effective that? date of uh, this October is a bit aggressive for us to be able right. to. Right, and we, we talked about that, and we said we are going to move that out. Did, did that get done here? Yes, it's on the last page. Okay. It's moved to July 1st, 19. Okay, and the, and the other part of this is, is part of the house pass. We're not changing the house pass version. Right. Well, the si section six is as past the house. Um, so any more questions on six? No, sure. All right. So on page seven, uh, excuse me, page eight, section seven. This this is the content from eight thirty one that you had worked on with Becky Wasserman and I have deposited into this bill. It's her uh, most recent language. Mm -hmm. um, to be honest, I haven't even read it. I don't know. What it is. <coughs> I assume you guys are. We talked about this at length, uh, and I think we were pretty much okay with this. Um, yeah. We had a question about the, on subsection two how to best define the uh, multifamily. Well, yeah, I think it was two, maybe been one and two, but whether we were going to cross reference this. Uh, use the standard that's in VHCB or, or or CBDG, and we decided to go with the CBDG one because that's sort of like what Naval Works uses already for right. their weatherization and home improvement. So that's what you put in here. Um, does anybody reading this have a problem with this? section if they have any reservations I'm happy to go back to two separate bills but no I think at this point it makes sense okay so to move us along I would move this bill subject to the changes that David's gonna make we can reconsider our vote if we don't like those changes, but I'd like to vote it right now. So I, I just one question on on the uh, we want effective to, dates. Oh, yes. So the effective date for the tax reporting has been moved back out a year. Yes. The database. And that was important for you guys. Yes. Okay. Great. I just wanted to note that okay. it was different from everything else. Kayla, do you have a sheet? So all... Oh my God. In favor of H907 as reflected a draft 3.1 with the understanding that a draft person is going to change that, uh, figure out how to write that section on page. Bottom of page, oh. page, page six. six. Page, page six. six. So will it have a new draft number, David, or will it effectively say 3.1? Probably we'll have a B4.1. Okay, so I just need it for the motion. Okay. I'd like so to do that. You're making the motion all too. All in favor, raise your hand, please. Thank you. Another one down. Okay. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> <Let's, laughs> we are rocking and rolling. Let's go to H707. And you're reporting this, baby. I am reporting this. For this. Uh, H707, sexual harassment. Julio. Yes. He's coming. i i Hello, have a seat, please. Yes. Is it for me? Am I yes. first? Yeah, I'm so sorry. Uh, we did push, you just put you off several times? On my desk, or do we already have something? We just, we just have it. We have one right here. Oh, okay. We seem to be uh, in order. I, I don't think we have a new draft on this at this point. Oh, I got my folder. Ready to go. We're finishing up. As you recall, you know, we have two large issues within this yeah. bill. They both Actually, the third. Um, the, uh, they revolve around the do not disclose agreements um, and do not darken my door. Uh, and this tension between the individual c 
complainant or complainant that wants to resolve their case sometimes. And the systemic issue of uh, not allowing these provisions in settlement agreements. Let me finish. And um, the other thing that I want to talk about is we've heard from all the witnesses that uh, education and resources are very important to this thing. And may, I haven't checked my computer, but I may be going, this is a conversation, I don't know how we're going to pull this off. Uh, I may be going into appropriations this afternoon, and they want sort of a wish list of where we want money. Um, so we need to have a conversation with the committee. Uh, but one of the areas I'm supporting is some money for this purpose to be added to this bill. So for education. For education. Yeah, and, and outreach. And where would it go? Oh. Where would the bill go? Where, where the would money the money go? go? That's a question. Likely candidate would be the Governor's Commission on Women. But it could go to the Human Rights Commission maybe. I don't I, I don't know. Could go to some other place in the executive branch. But um, someone should do some PSAs and yeah. and some modeling for so, training programs and outreach. So I'm gonna have care I'm gonna have Caleb print out what the budget that Carrie sent us. Is that okay? Sure. Which, by the way, that budget was some of the most specific. It was great. It was one of the best budgets we've got. It's what we've been asking for on all these things. Did I send it to the whole committee there. or just to I think you did. Okay. Let me just get Kayla. So, uh, could you enlighten us on what we should do on these two big issues? Uh, sure. Let me start. I'll, I'll do my best to respond to your questions and offer some, uh, some ideas, uh, hopefully. My name is Julio Thompson, Assistant Attorney General, Director of the Civil Rights Unit. Uh, our office, uh, Civil Rights, we are the principal state agency that forces Vermont state laws regarding sexual harassment for all employers uh, and labor organizations in the state of Vermont, except for the state as, as employer. The Human Rights Commission has that role when, when the state is the employer. Um, so. We have our office, I'm, I'm going to go directly to your questions. We also have a couple of rec small recommendations or tweaks in the bill that I think will um, cover issues Ooh, like version confidentiality. Are you, working, are you working off the House Pass version or the later version? I, I was working off the House Pass version. Okay. Um, so I don't know. So I, I'm happy to go to your Let's start topics. with the big first. Yeah, let's start, start with the big ones first. Okay. Um, so with respect to non-disclosure agreements, um, you know, in some cases they are valuable, in some cases they are not. We have many cases that come to us that, um, that involve individuals, um, women uh, often, but not always, who absolutely um, want a confidential resolution from the very time they call us until the very end. Um, and sometimes those women are represented by legal counsel, uh, Rich Cassidy and others, and sometimes they're not. Um, and uh, when we do our investigations, we have very strict confidentiality obligations, and we have a mediation program, which is confidential. Uh, and then the parties will, with the assistance of the mediator, work out an agreement about whether it's confidential or not. Oftentimes, the cases that come to us are not simply sexual harassment cases. It might be a claim that I was harassed on the basis of my sex, I was denied equal pay, I was subject or I was denied a promotion because of my race, I was denied overtime because I was misclassified as a supervisor. And sometimes the resolution is going to wrap all of those things together. So and, so, and sometimes the employer resolving all of those will ask for, they'll both ask for confidentiality. Uh, and the employee might agree not to apply for employment with the employer. I say it's sometimes good and sometimes not, because in some cases, the complainant doesn't, it doesn't have any intention to go to the, to apply with the employer. And if they can secure that promise in exchange for a higher settlement, that's a windfall. I don't know if that's a windfall, that's value to them. In a recent case, we had someone who complained of harassment, it wasn't sex harassment, it was on a different category, but that individual, unbeknownst to the employer, um, which she had not been in contact with it for over a year, had gotten married and was moving out of state. They got a job hundreds and hundreds of miles away, and the employer, in the negotiation with the mediation, we weren't a party to it, the employer 
so they'd per pay her additional money if she didn't work for this relatively small business concern. So when it was all done, she, you know, said, well, that was, that was, you know, good value for me because I don't intend to come back to Vermont. Uh, in other cases, you can have someone, I think the example was Sheraton, where a lifetime ban yeah, has really, really serious consequences. Um, the cases can break down one way or the other. I think there are common, common threads that sometimes you see or that. Um, where when we were viewing a settlement agreement, we, we might have concerns about overreaching of fairness. One is where the party is not represented by counsel. Um, another is if the employer is very large, uh, or if it covers a very large geographic area. Um, uh, we've had some cases um, where the agreement that's worked out in mediation is it's not a lifetime ban; it's a one or two year ban that sometimes mediators refer to as a cooling off period. So someone else has got a job, you agree the next couple of years, you agree not to apply. And after that, let's see, let's see how things have moved on. So we've, I mean, they're difficult to classify because sometimes they are really, really fundamentally unfair and sometimes they're, they're not. Sometimes they're a benefit to individuals. So. Correct and assuming that in a state like Vermont, the uh, do not talk to my door provision is in some ways less of an issue because there's not that very many large employers that have different divisions other than the state of Vermont where you want to go and work in another part of the company. Or do these things apply sort of worldwide? And uh, it depends. But right now, it's freedom of contract between the parties, and so it's whatever the parties. No, I know, but in terms of like a, if we were to ban those provisions from settlement agreements, right. it doesn't seem our our are either side asking for those very often. Uh, I I have I practiced for employment law and in civil rights employment discrimination in Los Angeles for 15 years. We represent a lot of big companies all over the world. We never had one of those. I only saw that. You never had a dark in my door? In, in, in Los Angeles, no. In so Vermont, we had, they, I see them pretty frequently. I don't know if that's a East Coast versus West Coast thing. Well, see, I was thinking big companies versus, we don't have that many big corporations that it would be as much of an issue as if you know, you're in California, where you're saying there are none, but... If like, someone, someone cleans room for Hilton. Oh, right. exactly. Uh, or yeah. Best Buy. Right. That, that would be tough. Uh, and the state. I mean, the state. The state it's our biggest... Right. Okay. So, um, so I'm just saying it's... I wish I could give you a very clear, right. obvious answer, but... Uh, again, with the whole topic of sexual harassment, we've been talking a lot about, it seems like we've been focusing a lot on sexual advances from one person to another, but that's not the only kind of sexual harassment claim that can arise. It could be somebody who just objects to things on the bulletin board. Um, there could be a romantic relationship that ends, and so it could be coupled with retaliation claims. They're kind of all over the map is what I'm saying. So. Um, I'm just trying to okay. so fill in the picture because we've kind of been looking in one part of the room and the law would apply to the entire room. So, um, For darkening the doorstep, um, the other observation I can offer, and again, I'm only offering my experience, uh, I haven't actually seen a case where there wasn't a provision where someone subsequently reapplied, was denied employment, and then alleged discrimination. I have and I've talked to some lawyers about that while this bill's been pending. Has that actually ever happened to you? And I haven't seen that happen. We've had one case in the Civil Rights Unit where someone who previously complained of sexual harassment roughly 10 years later reapplied for a job uh, and was fired. And in that case, we found it was actually retaliation. The, uh, the individual who had to answer the first investigation who was not in the hiring uh, chain of command found out, I think, a week after the person had been rehired at a different branch that it was this individual and then had her fired because she was a quote known hire. So can you just repeat what you said before as a fact pattern you've never seen? 
I haven't seen cases where someone settles a sexual harassment complaint or any employment discrimination complaint where with, that lacked one of these prohibitions on applying for employment. Right. Where the person then subsequently applied for a new job, was denied employment, and then made a new claim of discrimination. So, can you frame that positively? So you have, <laughs> so that I can understand. <laughs> so you have have not seen cases where darken the darken my door agreement is part of the NDR. No, I have seen those. What I haven't seen is, it, but not yeah, always. But what I haven't seen is a case where. The employer didn't ask for one, and then that employee came back, applied for a job, didn't get it, and then made another claim for discrimination. So the argument that I've been hearing, and I don't know, maybe it's a good argument, is that, oh, we need this because there's a risk a person will later just come back over. After they settle, they'll come right back, apply for a job, not get it, and then we're back in court again. I haven't seen that fact pattern play out. Right. You haven't ever. seen it, but we don't want it to happen. Um, so this is in support of removing. The I'm just saying I don't know whether that I have I don't know whether that's an appreciable risk. I haven't either in our work or talking to lawyers who work on the employer or plaintiff side been able to come up with an example of case where that's happened. So, which doesn't mean it could. Doesn't mean it could. Can you have the house deal with this? <clears throat> the do not talk to my door. Um, if they, <laughs> the, those provisions are explicitly prohibited in, in this uh, bill that we have. Yeah, in, in subsection H1, I believe. Um, so, yeah, the house would be in section one, subsection H1. An agreement to settle a claim of sexual harassment shall not prohibit, prevent, or otherwise restrict the employer from working for the employer or any parent company, subsidiary, division, or affiliate of the employer. So I hate to ask, but where are you? On page three. Page, page three. three. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Lines sorry. I'm to 21. Damien? Yes. Um, you know right, the provision that says that a complainant can't sign away their right to go to the Commission on Women <clears throat> or the Human Rights Commission? Uh, yeah, that's that's uh, the next, next is that, subdivision. Is that oh. in current law or that's just in the house pass version so so current law that's that's in current common law so case law um, but it's not currently in the statute so the ha the house pass version codifies that in statute okay but but under the current state of affairs practically speaking you can't practically speaking you can't uh, Require someone to sign away their right. There have been cases at the federal level right. uh, where they've struck down agreements that have done that. Not every individual might know that. Uh, so what the House Pass version requires is that the settlement agreement affirmatively state that they haven't right. given up their right to go to the EEOC or the Attorney General's office or whatever. And the reason I ask is to go back to the argument um, Julio referenced it, but it was made the other day by one of the witnesses. And they were saying that people want this, and they're willing to, to, to do a dark in my door provision, and they're willing to pay more in the settlement, and that's good for the victim. But there are other things that I think would be attractive, too, that are not allowed in law, like, for instance, signing away your right to make a, a formal uh, complaint after the NDA is signed. Right. So that's just not a persuasive argument to me that it, it would help the victim get more money by signing these things away. We're just saying there are some things you can't sign away. If you still want to do an NDA and it's of value to you, go ahead and do it, but you can't bargain with this right that you right. are going to be protected as having. You are prohibited from bad people's right. future employment here. You can always call the cops is what we tell people. Um, yeah. So last week we opened an investigation in a case where there was a settlement agreement because the information provided to us indicated there might be a violation of law and the practice was such that there could be future victims, so, so we opened an investigation this week. Mm -hmm. um, it's not uncommon in our experience to see settlement agreements that say that. Uh, sometimes when parties are negotiating settlement agreements, we tell the parties, um, 
just so you know, we, this doesn't affect our ability to pursue it and then they right. change the agreement. So my view is in, in Vermont, that provision about calling the cops, so to speak, um, is already well known and it's not, it's not very common in, in our experience to say that you can't do it. But, um, but, but that, is, um, that is something that um, a, lot of, a lot of individuals don't know. So there is value in telling them in a settlement agreement, you, yes. you retain this right. Yes. Do you, does your office have a explicit. position on we do make uh, banning yes. or limiting the House bill requires that non-disclosure agreements? Um, our view is that non-disclosure, so non-disclosure agreement, um, I think is going to um, just a broad ban on non-disclosure agreement. Our expectation would be that there would be fewer settlement agreements and the amount paid out in settlement agreements would be less. Okay. And because, and I understand that the purpose is to protect people from serial harassers. In our experience, and I'm only talking about the experience of the Attorney General's office for the last eight years, we don't have a lot of serial harassment cases that um, where someone, or even there are many sexual harassment cases that uh, don't even involve romantic overtures. It might be hostility towards women in the workplace. Women don't belong here. That's that could be a form of sexual harassment. Um, where, um, or it could be. But then wouldn't that be a serial harasser? Um, no, because the allegation might be a single instance of someone saying, what are you doing driving a truck? And that person comes to us as an alleged sexual harassment. If we did the investigation to its conclusion, we would find probably no violation of statute because that's, it's a single incident under the case law. It's not enough to create an abusive, intolerable work environment. But the employer, before they know what our answer might be, while we're doing the investigation, might opt to settle that case. They might settle it for $1,000. Um, or um, we just had a case that, that settled. It was no monetary payment. Um, so employers may settle those cases even though they don't buy, violate the law or buy, violate other individuals. And sometimes they're coupled with other claims that the employer is worried about, which might be there's an allegation of hostile work environment about the truck driver comment, but there's also an allegation that the person was underpaid overtime. And so the employer's going to settle all of that. Um, so under this bill, that would be, if a sexual harassment claim is included, that would be a settlement for sexual harassment, even though in the calculation of the employer, there was no money that was paid for that. The employers usually typically want to release of all employment-related claims. But you may not have lots of serial harasser right. situations because it's a complaint-driven system. And if people haven't been I mean, that, that doesn't mean they aren't there, and sadly, right. the older they are, the more likely they are to have done it before. We agree that people underreport sexual harassment just like they yeah, underreport crime. What I'm saying is that other cases that do come to us, in all of those cases, a standard matter of investigation is whether this person who's accused of harassment has done it before. Because the more victims, maybe those are people for whom we can get relief, or they are witnesses who can corroborate our one complainant's claim. So may I um, tag on to that? Then? Sure. It, it, you know, if you, do you do any uh, additional, when you do your investigation, do you do any further investigation with other, survey the rest of the female employees, if it's a female male uh, complaint, is there a way for you to find out in that work environment if it's happened before? Yes, yeah, so what we do typically with a complainant is to ask them, has this happened to anyone else before? Who are the coworkers? Who are the witnesses? Um, some organizations are large, and so we wouldn't interview all of the people. We would want to identify all the people who work with the target or the accused uh, and interview those individuals. Uh, a a non-disclosure agreement that they sign uh, with the employer doesn't prohibit them from providing it to us. The employer can't hide their settlement agreement from us. That's subject to legal process by us. So we ask the we would ask the employer, have you had prior claims? Produce those claims. Have you had prior settlements? Produce those settlements. And then when and the individuals are always identified in those claims and settlements, and then we go talk to them. What I'm saying is that it's not, in our experience, again, I'm just saying it's not representative of the world. I don't know who really knows out there. But um, our cases involve very, very, very good fact patterns. But the note, like cases where you have one person and we have a line of 10 women who say this guy's been there forever. 
in our experience, is that those are relatively rare. I'm not saying they don't happen. I don't say that they aren't out there and we don't know about them. So how, how, but this law would apply to all of the other cases that don't apply to serial harassment as well. So are you reading G1A as uh, essentially banning non-disclosure agreements? Um, in the version I passed the House, there, no, there is no banning of, there is no prohibition on um, this just basically says that you can't um, report um, in about, if there's an investigation of sexual harassment, an NDA can't provide or prevent the person from participating in that. That's um, <clears throat> that's actually um, the language is kind of weird to me. It says from opposing, disclosing, right. this all reporting or modifies right. the investigation of sexual harassment. How no, do you disclose a no partic participating in an investigation, I think, is like Separate. all one compactly. Okay. You're, and you're it's looking two. at the, the wrong It's two subsection. at the bottom of the page. I think Damien yes. pointed me to two. So if, if you will, you're looking at G1A, which relates to employment agreements. Uh, and we're talking about H1 and H2, yeah. which relate to settlement agreements. So this is a modified version of okay. It's a limitation on on disclosure. So you can't stop formal processes or participate in formal process going forward. But you could go. You you could sign one of these things, and you wouldn't theoretically be allowed to go to the press afterwards and publicize it. That's right. And on, on the issue of non-disclosure agreements, this. Um, I, w I just want to raise something for the committee's attention because I think it's important and I think that there's room in this bill to educate both employers and employees about this. Under federal labor and federal and state labor relations law, employees have a right to discuss their working conditions. That includes all conditions of employment for the purposes of either working together as a group of employees, either to unionize or just to have an employee committee saying, we want to talk to management about our working conditions or wages, or to provide what's called mutual aid and protection. So if someone is saying, yeah, I'm, I feel like I'm really working in a dangerous place because there's exposed electrical wires, another employee can say, you know, I brought that complaint up last year, and so they already know about it. This wasn't an accident. We ought to do something about it. That's called concerted activity that's legally protected under existing federal and state labor law. That also includes the discussions regarding wages, uh, work assignments, promotions, and sexual harassment. Um, so if I'm an employee now, our view is that if someone else, a coworker, complains about the same supervisor or about an in inadequate management response, those employees can discuss their working conditions for purposes not of helping the person who's already signed a settlement agreement, but for helping other employees be safe from sexual harassment or to improve their management process. So our recommendation would be that in the settlement agreement, the employees not only advise that you always have the right to call the cops, but that this agreement doesn't prevent you from, from engaging in otherwise protected concerted activity for mutual aid and support or for organizing employees. It doesn't matter who initiates that contact, whether it was the person who was first abused or the second abused person going to the first? If the per It's really about what the purpose of it is. So if one employee is talking to another employee for purposes of gossip or some other reason, um, that it that has nothing to do with improving the workplace, um, I mean, there have been cases on this since the 1930s about how you separate like when things are actually to improve employee welfare. Um, so if you're doing it because you're trying to help protect other individuals and you're still an employee there, that's in a lot of instances that's going to be viewed as concerted activity. So a non-disclosure agreement A would not be enforceable. So the employer says, oh, we're going to sue you because you breached that. And B, requiring it in the first place might already be a violation of labor relations law. So a lot of people don't know this. I've talked to lawyers, and they, they haven't even thought of it. They're like, oh, yeah, concerted activity. I think uh, Heather Wright mentioned it briefly in last week's testimony that there may be some activities that are already protected. So I was wondering whether we need to be more specific that that's 
prohibited in here. Maybe that's one of your recommendations. It is, and, and I and, and if we don't, the If we don't do it and we're passing the bill in relation to this, could the court interpret it that we're trying to go against previous case law? I think if someone brought it up in it, so if someone engaged in that concerted activity and the employer says you violated the non-disclosure agreement, please pay us our money, uh, I think if a lawyer raised the issue of concerted activity, it depends on the facts of the case, but I think there's, you know, in a lot of instances, we think the employee would prevail. Um, and, um, but for us, just when we've been talking about it since this bill's been pending, a lot of people aren't focusing on this, um, on this issue. Now, we are not the Vermont Labor Relations Board. They're, they deal with concerted activity. But employers can never enter into a contract that violates a statute. And there are cases out there, there was a case last year, two years ago, against Quicken Loans, that had an employment agreement that says you can't dis disparage management in any way. And that was challenged, and the Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit said, and you can't even chill employees' rights to discuss working conditions, including lousy management. Right. Um, so, so. You said statute. Are we talking statute and case law? Well, the National Labor Relations Act and the Vermont State Employees Labor Relations Act and its counterparts say that employees have the right to engage in concerted activity. And then the question has become, over the years, what does that mean? That's state employees. How about the private all, sector? All employees that are subject to labor relations law. Not every employee is subject to state labor relations law. That is true. But there are a lot of employees who are. And they all have the right, under existing law, to engage in concerted activity. Um, I, I mean, our concern is that when employees sign an NDA, I mean, a, a, a real concern of ours, in all instances, is if you have someone who's working there, someone is on, I, I mean, I've had this brought to me by several different people. Someone says, well, I don't know if I should complain about supervisor so-and-so because everybody loves him and they'll never believe him. He's a family man. And you have our complainant who signed an NDA who wants to say, oh, no, they already know about this guy because I complained about him last year. Let's go to HR and make a complaint. Let's work together on this. I'll support you. Well, our view is that that would be protected activity for the second employee's benefit, not for my personal benefit because he's not bothering me anymore. Maybe I don't work with him anymore. Um, but I don't think that a lot of employees or even their legal counsel are aware of that. So our view is that if you require them to put in that notice, and then when we do audits or when we do education and say, by the way, employers, if you do do an NDA, you can't prevent people from protecting people they work with to make sure you have sound working conditions. That's already existing law, so don't violate those laws. Um, so that would help in the serial situation or the systemic issue, but it really wouldn't be new law. It, w it would be informing of their rights that you may have rights under federal law. It would and make this it more can't. explicit. That's right. And it's not just serial. Which is part of our education here. Making everything more explicit so people are better educated about what their rights are. Yeah, and it's not just the area of serial. Sometimes... Um, systemic yeah, problems. Yeah, yeah, systemic yeah. problems. Yeah, which goes to why we want to actually devote some resources right. to it. Um, so we think that since you're already telling people that you have an existing right to go to the AG's office, you should also tell the employer you can't curb someone's labor relations rights to engage in concerted activity. And that is part of our outreach and education. Employers are going to know that because they've got to stick that in there, otherwise the NDA wouldn't be effective. Senator Bell, do you have a question? Uh, I'm just concerned about the time and I'm wondering if we're going to hear from Damien on the language or what sort of what your vision is here. Um, I wanted to give him as much, uh, who as much time as he needed. Do you have anything more you want to add at this point? Yes, there are a couple of things I want to talk about. That. For our office's perspective, one of the most important tools um, would be the uh, inspection, right? Um, for To be able to show that employers are actually doing the training. Um, oh. Our view is that Vermont ought to follow uh, the example of states like California, Connecticut, and Maine and mandate training rather than just encourage training. Last year, Maine required a training. It now requires training for employers with 15 or more employees, separate training for supervisors so that they know they have those special duties. Our inspection right, right now uh, doesn't provide any level of confidentiality for information we receive in our audit. 
And it's critical that that be added. It's very small language, maybe just a cross-reference to other statutes that protect that information. Because what we anticipate is that some of the audits would be, or inspections would be done just randomly. We might survey industries. But sometimes we, like our counterparts and other agencies that have inspection rights, might receive a tip or a complaint from somebody who's afraid to be identified and says, these problems exist here. Um, and then we, or if we are in the middle of conducting an inspection, we talk to so many human resources who might say to us, thank God the cavalry's here, let me tell you what's going on, and we're taking notes and those sorts of things. We would not want the employer to be able, through a public records request, get that information from confidential sources. So we would like, we would like a provision that says information that's provided to us during the inspection is confidential. Not what we do in terms of outreach, but in terms of information we get. Because we don't want to compromise sources of information. Did you, you raise this in the House? I did. And they just, just declined to put that in? I, I, I wasn't there. I was out of the country during markup, so I, I don't know what the discussion was. But that is a critical feature because we, every year, we get people who tell us about things. So, okay, so we got to go to that. Okay. We got something else, too? Um, Mandated training. Yeah, that's right. So if we mandated the training, maybe we could also figure out a, a, a relatively reasonable uh, training option for smaller businesses that could make it affordable and it would work with the commission on to find that or with, with HR to find that kind of yeah. I, I think that's right. I think the other issue is a very minor tweak, which is that right now there's a 48-hour notice requirement for doing these inspections. In some circumstances, it's more convenient for an employer to have us do it on shorter notes. Can you get those in writing to Damien sure. today, if possible? And yes. the mandate, did you raise that in the House? I was asked um, in what risk, yes, I did mention that in the House because they were, they were asked, what, do other states do more, are they more proactive in Vermont? And I said one area where Vermont, in most respects, leads. But one area where they have fallen out of the lead is in training, that other states are not mandating training. There are probably a dozen states that mandate training by statute for government employees, uh, even if not for the entire public sector. Right now, that's not we, mandated. Do we do that already? I'm sorry? Do we do that for government employees now? Well, government employees means all government employees. So I can't tell you what the states and towns are doing. I can tell you what the state of Vermont's doing. Because what I've seen and I've actually thought about, as opposed to mandate, which is a, something that's a, a, a significant step, um, as we do frequently, uh, we try to lead by example uh, in terms of our procurement policies. You know, I, I think we could look into our procurement policy in the state of Vermont and it says people who want state money and contract have to be somewhat model citizens and put some requirements there. It's, it's a big step down from mandating all employers provide this training, but it is a step in the right direction. Have you seen any other states do that? For government contractors, yeah, a couple of states have done that, as well as for their state employees. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. And if you could be in touch with Damien, that would be great. Sure. Um, oh, Damien. It's this afternoon. No, I can't. But before we read Damien, let's just talk about the resource issue. Are people interested in putting, suggesting that we put on this bill some sort of appropriation yes. to do some yeah. trading and outreach? I just have a question. Go have you it. had an initial conversation with the chair of appropriations, or will this be new information? I don't unfortunately, want to unfortunately, most of my information with the chair will be new. Other than okay. um, that one. I actually, seen. that's not true. I wrote, I mentioned this in an email that I wrote to her. Okay. But very, very vaguely. Uh, so to that I mean, end, I have my note for you. I mean, I think that. we do not want the bill to get stuck on the wall. So I want to know how we're going to navigate. I don't that. think there'd be a danger of it being stuck on the wall. I think that section would get stripped. It could be stripped. I don't but think it, anybody's okay. going to. Just want to make that but, explicit. Yes. One of the things we're talking about is a cultural shift and, and educating uh, people I, I mean, with this cultural shift. It, the cultural shift, I mean, the mandated training, I, I, I don't know how I missed that piece in here. 
but I, you know, this money could uh, is is Carrie's done a terrific budget for us on this. Uh, we could also conceivably ask Tom, who's here, uh, and anybody else to get a notion of what mandated training would cost if we could come up with a model that that people could use and bulk and you know uh, make easily accessible to employers around the state who haven't already done it. Many have done it. Um, but if we're going to really be serious about a cultural shift mm -hmm. and trying to affect it, we need to put resources into it, and we do need a mandate training, in my humble opinion. So, um, one question for Damien. Mm -hmm. What you've heard here, is there any informational or course correction that we're totally off base on in this discussion at this point that you've heard? Uh, not that I've heard, I'm not sure all of the course corrections that might be on the table. I know what Julio was talking about now, okay. um, and I've, I've discussed some of that with him already. Okay. So let me, I, I, I want to go around the table quickly if people have thoughts. I'll express my own. I think I'm at a place where I want to continue where the house is on do not dock in my door. I think that Julio has offered us a, a solution that I think is consistent with existing law, but by publicizing the, what's the term again, Julio? The right to engage in concerted activity. Concerted, concerted activity. activity. Have that. that will make a big difference in getting at systemic problems without necessarily uh, banning do not disclose agreements, uh, do not disclose agreements. Um, and I'm- They're banned in this bill. No. No, no, they're, they're not. not. They're, I no. thought we prohibited those agreements. No, we as passed by the House, it's the, not. This, so, uh, to be clear. Darken my door. Do not darken my door is prohibited. Yeah, then, that's what I thought. But there's yes, different. but do not darken my door in a non-disclosure. Oh, right, I'm sorry. Dark, I, heard, I, I yeah. haven't heard we'd shifted to NDRAs. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Yeah. So, yeah. NDAs, I think it's important to still have. We've heard. Very articulate. And Richard, both of them. Well, I just want to make sure that we don't fast track this in the next, you know, 24 to 48 hours and not, I, I want to have time to sit down with Damien and go it, through it line by line. Good because I, I, there are, I there are a lot of moving Perf parts here. Perfectly reasonable. Yeah. Okay. And I'd appreciate waiting until Tuesday anyway for us to, to win. Okay, but I want to get Damien in a position to start drafting and I want to get a sense of where the committee is. Uh, we could go, we could stay with the houses on NDAs, uh, and just you know, don't say anything about concerted effort. Or we can explicitly say that the agreement shouldn't have anything that bans a concerted effort, which is existing law right now. But we'll make employers aware of that because the practicing public is not aware of that. So I think it gets at the systemic issue in a practical way, but doesn't ban these agreements. Um, so I think that it's sort of an an opening that he's sort of given us of a good, uh, you know, is this, elegant solution. Is this to get rid of the, uh, I'm just having a little confusion with, for me, the problematic thing was having another allegation offered by a third party breaking the non-disclosure agreement agreed to by these two parties. So when you say concerted action, you're talking about. I, I would maybe, defer to Julio, but the way I understood it is it does become somewhat factual, specific. I mean, if you're engaging in gossip and you break your non-disclosure agreement, then that wouldn't be okay. But if you're if you're trying to get at a systemic problem, you can contribute the information of your experience to the next person in an effort to, to not see that repeat offender, for but, instance. But, but the I, difference between those two things could be in the mind of the, the speaker, right? What you're calling gossip might be that person saying, I'm trying to engage in. You know, I think gossip is unfair. I think talking about it in the sure we'll we'll talking about. Everything in law could get factually specific. You can't cover every instance to, to, to get at it. So you've got to look at what's a reasonable interpretation of, you know, was that gossip or was it really to get at a. Well, we had been talking about a formal procedure that would trigger somebody getting out of their NDA. So in other words, a lawsuit or something? A lawsuit, a, a suit to the 
Commission on Women or the Human Rights Commission. Right? And I think that's I, in there, at least a part of it. Okay, those things are appropriate. Well, this goes back to Becca's point. Um, so we'll spend more time on it. Right. But, and, and what is the, the, the term that Julio was using? Concerted. Concerted activity. Concerted activity. And so I think we need to see, I need to see the statutory language around that. Right. So I really understand what that encompasses. So, and that, that, that protects um, the companies that are subject to the labor relations law. Do you, do you want me right. to prepare a short summary of um, the law around concerted activity yes. for the committee? I mean, this is, yeah, as Julio mentioned, there is there are literally reams of case law on this. Okay. But I can give you a short summary of kind of this is the language we're talking about. These right. are the employers that employees that are covered, which is a, a very broad swath of of employees within the state, both the public and private sector. Um, and then here are some examples of what they look at in a case. Um, and I'm not sure. I'll look to see if I can find any cases that are specific to sexual harassment. But I'm not sure if they're they're out there. But I can touch base with Julio to see if he knows of any, or or Tom too, if you may be aware of some as well. So I'll touch base with them and see if they're aware of any on this particular issue that may be illuminating for the committee. So you can kind of see what constitutes concerted activity, because it is very very fact based. It deals with the work environment. It deals with the workers. It deals with how they actually approach to the issue um, and that the court looks at that or the labor board that's considering the issue always looks at uh, those issues very closely right so. given labor I have a state workforce development board <laughs> meeting right this minute Ooh. that I'm late for so I just okay go for it um, we'll talk some more on Tuesday I'll be back so. at one no, no.